open yourself up. That's exactly right. Pop. There I, you go. I've got a nudes girl. She sends out nudes. Chris Bagel, Pornhub.com. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. We should get a verified Pornhub account <laughs> yeah. wall. Yep. And then just for the SEO purposes. Nice Wait, what's this? Number one, a number one podcast on um, on Pornhub. <laughs> That's a hell of a way to advertise. I just me. feel like we would be the uh, least popular podcast on Pornhub. Oh, yeah. Mm, I'm inclined to disagree. Unless you just, like, flexed your calves and it was only calf-only videos. Unless you some chubbychasers.com. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, and the ads and the product placement it's, with that. It's alarming how popular that kind of stuff is. Because yeah, everybody's got a fetish. Everybody. But that one. Mine is Everybody. <laughs> Check one, too. Where's the Abdul porn category on, on Pornhub? <laughs> Sexyblacklesbians.com. <laughs> Don't tell my wife. Well, hell, that's how I met her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she was on my email list. All right. Here oh, by we the way, go. eight years. Since what? Anniversary. Oh, wow. That's today? That's a lot. Uh, Tuesday, September 5th. He was there. Yeah. Who would have? Uh, we. I won the pool. Uh, I, I definitely <laughs> did not think that Abdul would be married longer than I would. <laughs> really? Oh, oh, well. You meet your ex-wife? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot in uh, common, did you? Well, uh, that's a good point. <laughs> Abdul, can you hear anything? Nope. Was he your best man? How about, how about now? Now I can hear you. All right. Is that good volume? Uh, turn down just a little bit. Okay. You young people are going deaf. No wonder. I know. You guys are all deaf by 35. Was Abdul? Was he your... Uh... I was in his wedding. I was the best man. No, my brother was. My Ooh, brother, oh, yeah, yeah. My to. brother appointed himself best man. You ha I mean, you kind of have to. No, I don't have to. He... My mom didn't pick her sister, and it created a grudge forever. Oh, uh, well, see, my brother and I are not petty like that. See, my best man was actually my best friend from college. Yeah, well, yeah. Johnny. Not, you don't, yeah, now you my brother brothers? was... Uh, well, yeah, but one of my brothers was in my wedding. Oh, but you have multiple brothers. That yeah. makes, that's, makes it easy. You see, and everybody who was in my wedding was from a different life experience. Mm. Like college, Germany, you know, work. So everybody represented a different... But then again, the wedding Stereotype. party... Stereotype. Actually, the wedding party was more my wedding party than my wife's. Huh. My wife only had like three people in the wedding. And then everybody how many... Everybody else was mine. Did you do two groomsmen per bridesmaid? Uh, no, it was one-to-one. -one. But was, so just three and three? Uh, no, we had like, what, like ten? Oh, yeah, you had a lot. A lot. Yeah. I had a 400-person wedding. Yeah. Well, Big wedding. Yeah, well, because you were already on WXNT by then, right? Yep. So, I, yeah. I had my wedding sponsored, too. And, yeah, he, he did. And then right <laughs> Oh, my after, God. And then right <laughs> after that, Sam and I went to her 10-year uh, <laughs> reunion or something like that. Remember when you um, didn't want to go to her birthday slash graduation party because you were helping a 21-year-old with her Tumblr? You, she was 20, and you always you always bring this up, but it's not the the correct story. We'll correct, uh -oh. we'll correct it some other day. It's a convenient revision history it is it is very convenient it's <laughs> fake news fake news all right you guys ready welcome to we are libertarians i am your host chris spangle we are libertarians brings you all of the irreverence modern politics deserves thinks uh, think of us as the love child of national review and mad magazine we explain to you what the hell is happening in our world today and how we can fix it by thinking differently Please be sure to rate and review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, share this episode with friends, and support us through PayPal or Patreon at wearelibertarians.com. It's just Patreon now. i got to update the copy. We are supported by listeners like you, so $5 a month and up helps us grow, and we are always taking your questions and comments via email at editor at wearelibertarians.com. If you're new to the program, we catch up for the first uh, 15 to 20 minutes or so and then dive deep into analyzing current events in society from a libertarian perspective. This show is for adults by semi-adults, so please be warned, the language is strong and often offensive. Joining me is my uh, lovely co-host, Greg Lenz. Greg, how are you doing? I'm doing well, buddy. How are you today? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, also joining us is our, our other co-host, our fourth co-host, Harry Price. How are you doing, Harry? Going good, going good. Now, uh, you, you called this episode the what? <laughs> <laughs> On Tuesday, I called it the Kooning. <laughs> uh, Excuse me. Now, uh, that is offensive. Now I hope you didn't offend the sensibilities of our delicate guest uh, Abdul Hakim Shabazz, who makes uh, you are the most reoccurring guest now on We Are Libertarians History. Abdul, well, I feel like valedictorian in summer school. <laughs> <laughs> Valedic I'm sorry, salutatory. Uh, my bad. A gold, <laughs> a gold medal winner in these. Never mind. Special <laughs> now uh, Abdul was my. Somebody, where are the hearing impaired kids? One way from home. <laughs> 
there. I look at the family guy when they're all asleep. I get up and the alarm's gone. <laughs> now, Abdul was my boss uh, 10 years ago. So it was uh, 2004 in December when I became your intern. And then uh, you tortured me for the next four and a half years. And really, since then... Uh, so for 13 years now, it's hard to believe that you've been here in town for 14 years now. I agree. I, I know. Because that was not the game plan. A black lawyer from Chicago uh, who has a, a Muslim name. Uh, who eats bacon and smokes cigars. <laughs> and, right. and makes Jeb Bush look like a counter-revolutionary. Yeah, like, yeah pretty much. Mr. <laughs> Establishment. <laughs> right. Uh, so Abdul Hakim Shabazz joins us. He is the uh, proprietor and founder of IndiePolitics.org which is really the only place to get news on politics in the Indiana. The award-winning indie politics. What award. award did you give yourself? Uh, actually, no. It was the <laughs> Indiana Press Association, best columnist. Really? Two years in a row. Congratulations. That's very prestigious. How do we, how do we buy one of those, Greg? We only get into Trump you know, things and right. the occasional Ted, Lion Ted Cruz event. That's, right. that's basically what we're going to I got to meet to. Mrs. Ted. Mrs. Ted. <laughs> Mrs. Ted and I hung out. I actually ever notice how Ted Cruz looks like the Ed Grimley character from Saturday Night Live? He looks exactly like him, yeah. All you gotta do is just put the checkered shirt on him and pull his pants up uh, to his nipples. <laughs> Did you ever see... And put him on Wheel of Fortune? <laughs> he, oh, Ted. He could flawlessly blend into Wheel of Fortune. Like, that is his, <laughs> that is his support group. Yeah. Good old Lion Ted. Uh, that's Dead Kill JFK. He did. Now, <laughs> Abdul, do you have any conspiracy theories that you uh, subscribe to? I do not believe in conspiracy theories. I never do. Because okay. you are attributing a certain amount of acumen to people that does not exist. Okay. For uh, the perfect example, uh, and you were with us, uh, remember back in 2007, the May primary, when Beth White had just got elected and taken over and the polling places didn't open and yeah. people got disenfranchised, it was just a... Complete cluster cluster truck meltdown. It was not, yeah. And people were calling and saying this was a conspiracy to disenfranchise Republicans and blah, 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 blah. Right. And I was like, no, folks, I hate to be the one to disappoint you. Never it's attribute. A classic walks a bold path. Sorry about that, everybody. True. Same difference. Yeah. Never attribute. <laughs> Literally just like the old show. Yep. Nothing's changed in 13 years. Except you're awake. <laughs> <laughs> At the time. Right. So, yeah, I mean. The, yeah, the, never, never attribute to sinister and, you know, conspiracies what can be explained by mere stupidity. You've uh, had a first-hand experience with that here lately with someone you've had to disavow that you had previously allowed in the Apple yes. universe. As, as you all know, I'm a big believer in free speech and open debate and, you know, let people just have at it, and I'll put up with a lot. Right. I mean, a lot, a lot. I mean, right here. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. But you're right. Uh, a certain individual who shall be uh, dominatrix-less. M so Melissa like, batshit crazy Donna here. Yeah, right, yeah. No, we talk about her all the time on the big show. Big Bird. Yeah, Big Bird. That's, that, an that big, to, that's an insult to Big Bird. <laughs> <laughs> that Big Cow Melissa. <laughs> More like Mr. Snuffleupagus. They <laughs> 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 only exist in your imagination. <laughs> she, she wrongly claims that uh, we made a meme calling her the Jurassic cunt, and uh, I didn't make the meme and Greg didn't make the meme. No. And uh, so she, she continues to smear our good name. I have a rule that I would never use that type of language to describe another human being, but you want to talk about the day I came close to making an exception? Uh-huh. That... What did she do? Um, <laughs> she went after... I want to say she went after a very good friend of mine, a fellow reporter, uh, Mary Beth Schneider. Right. Who's a longtime reporter for the Annapolis Star. We do Channel 6 together. Yeah. Analysts. Mary Beth and I have known each other since I got here. Good Love reputation. Adapt. Good reputation. Always fair. And Melissa went after her... And I thought it was, that was just over the top. I was right. like, you know what? Because the media people, we're like the NATO alliance. You attack one of us, you attack us all. Mm -hmm. right. So the United States had to step in to help my friends in Germany. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good analogy. Now, yeah. who would she be? Mm. M Melissa? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Kim Jong-un. <laughs> okay, no. the Hermit Kingdom. No, because he's got at least like a nuclear weapon that is dangerous. Right. <laughs> She'd be more like the dictator from the Slovakian, Re Slovenian Republic. Yes, <laughs> yes the <laughs> unrecognized by yeah. the UN Slovakian Republic. Yeah, you're like the DDR. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's this. It's basically just a bunch of oath keepers off in an area no one wants to visit. You yeah. know where Borat's from. Exactly. Right. <laughs> Krapistan. <Yeah. laughs> I, I don't know if you've seen Borat lately, but I watched it about two months 
months ago. I accidentally purchased it, purchased it with a coworker's credit card, which is the best way to buy a movie. <laughs> and it, it it holds up. It is hysterical. Oh, it's such mean, a great there's movie. There's a elected member of the United Sta- States House of Representatives speaking in tongues at a tent revival. How could it not hold up? <laughs> yeah, that's about right. <laughs> yeah. So, so, eventually, reality does become fiction. Yeah. So, so that, that really was foreshadowing to the Trump phenomenon. More like foreskinning. <laughs> <laughs> now, this uh, program had uh, Melissa on one episode 116, mm-hmm. and uh, at the time, we, we were friends, and we had been friends for about 10 years, and then we chose different sides of a gubernatorial campaign. Uh, I believed that the person who ran, uh, who, who had the best Libertarian Party results was the better candidate than the guy who had been arrested for spousal abuse twice. So, and... She was like, nope, he, he, and he never really gave a good explanation. You can go back and listen to some of those episodes and hear the explanation, but she, she just made it nastier and nastier, and listen, I let it go and let it go and let it go. Greg, you don't let things go sometimes. You, you, you really, you just, you turned on her, and it was disgraceful what you did. Well, I'm pro-bullying. That's not a, that's not a you know, most people are against, you know, cyberbullying and bullying today. Not me. I think it, I think it, uh, it refines the character in a way that, you know, accommodation and tolerance doesn't. I'm not necessarily a big fan of bullying, but some people just got to smack the shit out of them. <laughs> Physical <laughs> violence, not bullying. You were there in 2007, as was I. I was the person, because I was your producer, I had access to so many people, and I was the person who put together a lot of the people that were at that first meeting that she takes credit for. And, and, and just so the audience knows what we're talking about, uh, back in 2007 uh, was the genesis of the property tax crisis in Indianapolis and in Marion County, mm-hmm. where the property taxes, the assessments had finally caught up and they were going through the roof. Right. And literally you had people who were, you know, 20, 30 percent increases in their property tax bills. And all hell was getting ready, you know, to break loose and unfold. And just to give you the guys an idea how big this was. This is all pre-social media, so no Facebook invites, no e no none of that stuff. Yeah. A thousand people, just through word of mouth and a couple of blog posts, showed up on Monument Circle on a Sunday afternoon to march from City Hall to the Capitol building to protest their property tax bill. That's yeah. way harder than a like and a share. That's a, And it's, it's work. <laughs> I know. And, and they actually showed up mad as hell. And did something and, and about not going to take it, it anymore. It, it was there were at least three or four big, big, uh, really the first Tea Parties. Yeah, the culmination, or you know, the predecessors yeah. to the Tea Party phenom- or, uh, arrival. And to give her credit, she came up with the idea of dipping a tea bag in the canal, and and really, it was the Indianapolis tax protesters who, in my view, were the first Tea Parties here in that era. Because the first rally was actually done by. Uh, Former congressional candidate, soon to be current congressional candidate, again, Andy Horning, uh, doing a whole new rally outside the governor's residence yep. Yep. on 46th and Meridian. Andy, yep. an author at WeAreLibertarians.com. He's, he's in the feed if you go back and listen to, listen to Andy. His message hasn't changed. The most well-known libertarian candidate in Indiana politics, in my opinion. Because he's been doing it so long. That's what I mean. Right. He's just that guy. Over, he's kind of like the over. Indiana Ron Paul. <laughs> over again. Dude. Got more friggin' fucking reruns than Star Trek. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so Melissa wrote this fictitious book where she took credit for the mayor of Indianapolis getting ousted as if it was her doing, which no no single person could take credit, although you can try. I can, and I did. <laughs> right. Because I gave Greg a voice right. when nobody else would. Literally, you were the only person that would interview Greg Ballard. And, uh, who was an absolute no-name, somebody who, well, you know what, he's been a hard worker for the party for a while, and since this actually is not, shirt... Actually, not really. Uh, Greg and his wife had just moved back to Indianapolis a couple of years ago, because yeah. he had just retired uh, from the Marines as lieutenant colonel, and just sort of, you know, it's just your, it's your you know, classic story, your average citizen says, you know what, I've had enough. And which, by the way, was a brilliant campaign slug. I have no idea where that came. Up. <laughs> All right. I know. I know where it came up. I just don't know who came up with it. Right. It the living room at Eleventh and Alabama. <laughs> okay. A long time ago, a galaxy far, far away. Now he because he was a lot like the guy that ran against Denny or uh, Hogsett. The Republican Chuck, um, I can't remember his last name. Oh, Chuck Brewer. Yeah, and that was sort of the same type of profile, was it not? Uh, it was. It was a little different. I mean, Chuck was a small business person, military. But the situation when Chuck ran versus when Greg Ballard won, ran were totally, completely different political sets. Political environment. Yeah, you know, political environments and different sets of circumstances. Right. And the one thing about what a lot of people don't give necessarily credit for uh, was my closest friends in town, a gentleman by the name of Tom John, who was Marion County chairman at the time, 
Because people say the Republicans didn't help Ballard. Well, actually, they did, because they focused on the council races, saying, hey, if I can get you to vote for a Republican counselor, you'll probably vote for a Republican yeah. mayor. Yeah. And, but, no, but, but also, one thing they did, too, was... He, he sees the, me rolling my eyes. That's why well, he's talking. Because, <laughs> because I was actually there. And one of the things they did, which really worked, was in certain council districts, they did not run a Republican challenger in certain African-American districts. Because if the, after the voter thought, hey, Peterson's going to win anyway... My person doesn't have a challenge. Guess what? Why bother go vote? Right. I'll just stay home. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a brilliant way to do sort of reverse voter suppression, which is you don't give somebody a choice. Right. It's, it's covert yeah. voter suppression. Yes. Yeah. yeah why and stand it, in line? Yeah. 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 Why stand in line to vote for some people you know are going to win? So guess what? They stayed home. But <laughs> and because remember, remember election night, those precincts closed up first and they closed up early. And Ballard had a you know a, a semi decent, but a small lead, but still a lead. Nobody was saying, well, you know, Center Township will come in, and then that'll just, you know, sweep it to Ballard. But Center Township had already closed. This is some straight-up autism right here. He is, he is having the time of his no. life. No. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is like Jeremiah talking about the race. No, because, no, because you were at, I sent you to a Democratic headquarters, and I sent our friend Scott Manning yep. to Republicans. And you were there, like, you know, because I'm going to say you interviewed Joanne Sanders for, like, five seconds because she was just so mad. Oh. Because they could not believe that they had lost. Oh, it was, it was the grimmest election night party I've ever been at. And I've been at every Libertarian Party election night <laughs> since 2008. But, but in the defense of that, you know, the expectations lost, not... Univer like you know, universally agreed to win. Well, uh, wasn't it like Ballard had like two months out, fifty thousand dollars in the bank, and Peterson had like two million? <laughs> yep. I mean, it was some yeah. crazy disparity. And, er and, and everybody knew from the polling that was done, the limited poll, that Peterson was vulnerable to an unnamed Republican. But the problem was when you put a name next to it, then Peterson did. You know, he did relatively well. And the big names at the time, people like Susan Brooks, who was the U.S. Attorney, people like Carl Brizzy, who was a Marion County Prosecutor. Uh, Murray Clark was a former state senator and state chair, and Ike Randolph was a city council member. They all took a pass. Yeah. Because they all thought Peterson, well, he might be vulnerable, but he's still got $3 million. Sure. And they're all my friends. I love him to death, but nobody had the cojones to step up and do it. Ballard, Why take the loss and have it on the resume? Yep, yeah. Ballard did and won. Twice, <laughs> but but he could have won a third time. I think. I think he could have won a third time. Yeah, I do too. Uh, and actually, had he run, Hawks it wouldn't have. Uh, yeah. Why would you? Because Joe got out of the race. Remember? Because here's the thing about Ballard here in Indianapolis, and I know we're getting too n local for national politics, but super local. I mean, it was it was township level, but it was just such a massive. If if you ever want to study in freak elections. Go back and look. Go go back and read Indiana Barrister Abdul's blogs from the time, and 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 we actually have a lot of the podcast and the interviews stored somewhere in my website. Um, but it, it's just it was a fascinating study in upset politics at the time, none of which Melissa Donahue could take any credit for. And then every and, and think about but this more on a more global scale, which is when people say, well, regular politics is all just for the insider class, which for the most part it is. Thank you, God. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that every day. But <laughs> if, if you if you think like a regular person can't step up and say, you know what, I'm tired of the way things are, and I want to make a change and a difference, it can be done. It's work, and it's a hell of a hill climb, but it is not impossible. Politics ain't no beanbag. That's actually the exact right. strategy I advocated for Gary Johnson's presidential campaign. Do not let anyone see him or speak. Just present the resume of a two-term Republican governor of New Mexico as an op like as a, a third option in Trump versus Hillary, and you will get 10%. But do not introduce him to people and let him go down into, you know, get trapped by policy questions because it'll result in failure. Yeah. And everyone was like, that's crazy. But I, now I feel a little bit validated that that's not such a crazy option. Right. You know, it's specific to the kind of race and the dynamics yeah. of that race. But you put a name to something, you end up seeing a surge in support for, or you create an opposition vote. Yeah. He shops around well. He, he hits around everywhere All, else. His everywhere resume is written, perfect. Yeah. It's still he talks to people that you're like, oh, boy, now he's forcing Anne Frank to bake the Nazi cake. Yep. So, so <laughs> let's circle back, and let's introduce tonight's topic, because uh, as... That's the reason why we have two Negroes on the set here. That's right. Let's <laughs> talk about some Negro things. Well, Harry, uh, as Harry... Do you like your fried chicken dipped in batter, or do you use Parmesan cheese crusting? <laughs> <laughs> I, with, with, with you two, trust me, I'm much oh, more the fried food expert than We you are the Negroes because you two are the foodies. Harry drinks Perrier and spends his evenings walking around the house in a smoking jacket with his putter. 
And, and, I knew club soda and Splenda with a splash of lime. Right. And <laughs> Abdul. Love Perrier and Lemon. So. <laughs> Abdul is a member of every private club in the city. Yeah. Not, Except for Hillcrest. I haven't decided to join yet. <laughs> we'll talk off air. Yeah. They're, they're t- yeah, they have too many, you know. Actually, no, but actually, no, I've been thinking about taking up their tennis stuff. And that's a good place to go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's right across from where I work. Yep. We can, uh, you, can, we can go hang out. Yeah. yeah. That'll never happen. He'll ne- <laughs> he would never invite me to one of his clubs. Actually, yes, I would. Would you? Yeah. Antelope Club? Yeah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Antelope Club is uh, its a great club, but it's not the Columbia Club where all his fancy friends. I'm his side piece. <laughs> him his political side piece. Uh, he doesn't want to take me in front of the governor. Uh, now, Harry... Uh, as he, he takes you to the mistress shop across from the dry cleaner. That's exactly right. <laughs> uh, so we, we want to talk about... Uh, Abdul has, has run into uh, some... some Problems, some notoriety. Of some I, don't, I don't see. I don't call them problems. I call them opportunities to show people how stupid they are. Right, <laughs> and you're good at that. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I was at uh, Penn Station last night, and uh, fully off the rails with the diet. With the diet, for those of you wondering, but I'm at at Penn Station last night. And Greg, you know I'm not a sports expert. You 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 like to given your feelings on sports, you play up your ignorance to infuriate those who do care about it. But you actually do follow it, right? And uh, so over the uh, after the uh, Floyd Mayweather fight, uh, NFL star from the Seahawks, Michael Bennett, got arrested, and it was a pretty uh, the TM, TMZ has the video, and the video is pretty rough. And it's brought a lot of issues to the forefront regarding, you know, the the black community and policing. And Michael Bennett was very vocal on uh, Colin Kaepernick's protests where Kaepernick kneeled during the national anthem because he says, I'm not going to support a country that supports police officers that violate my community. And Michael Bennett was a part of that. And so it is uh, it is coincidental that he ended up getting harassed himself. If you you can just Google it, but so I'm watching this in the Penn Station last night, and I hadn't heard about this at all. And they show sports because everyone watches sports, and I just see one black woman. She's probably in her 60s, staring at it intently with just this sad look on her face. And then I look over at a young mixed girl who's probably about 10 years old. She's she's I don't know what she she was definitely. From out of town, as Greg would say, no, but she was probably she was probably half white, half black, and I felt my white get my white white guilt kicked in when I saw her face as she was watching it, and you know, to me, when I saw that story, it had no impact on me whatsoever, but for that little girl processing that, who's about ten years old. I I just started to think what her life and what she must be thinking about and what her future and that brought me back to a conversation that Harry we've had on this you you carry your your weapon you're mm-hmm. a second amendment believer mm-hmm. but you know after Phil- uh, Castile uh Philando Castile you yeah. said I didn't leave with my gun tonight to come over here because I was afraid yeah that's a position that I've never been in so I don't feel qualified to necessarily talk about what it is like to be a black man in America. Lord what knows. What makes you think we are? Right. Lord knows. <laughs> this is my topic area, to be honest. So, <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, y- you know, it it is right up at the forefront of societal discussion with things like Charlottesville and Antifa coming out and, and the alt-right starting to rise. Mm-hmm. And... These various groups like Black Lives Matter starting to bubble up, and uh, this this show we invited Abdul on when he uh, received another award. Yeah, this time not from his peers, but from the local uh, Black Lives Matter group, Black like, Indie Live group, or something like that. Right, the, the Black yeah. Liberation Theologists of Indianapolis. The BLTs. Yes, the BLT. <laughs> the BLTs. No mayo. Right. No, no mayo at That's all. Nutella. <laughs> <laughs> now, Abdul, you were voted in the top five what? Number three. Number three? No, I was number four. It was Real House Negroes of Indianapolis. <laughs> yes. That's uh, what it was. That's right. And I got, actually, I'm not quite sure if number one was the top one or me as number four was the top one because you kind of built a list. Yes. And so I wasn't quite sure if they were saying number one was the best one or me number four. 
because number one was my good friend Reverend Charles Harrison, who spends his days, you know, trying to keep people alive. He's you know? he's an amazing man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. a community community policing and like yeah. oversight yeah. organization. They mentioned yeah. Jason Woodlock from ESPN, who they hate and can't stand. Uh, the one young lady, uh, who also, Sage Steele, Sage mm-hmm. Steele, ESPN reporter. Yeah, mm-hmm. and me. So I was number four. And what did you do? I mean, what did you ever do? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Well, I know what I did. I just didn't buy their bullshit. That, and I called them out on it. That's <laughs> that's what it was. And then. You see, unlike somebody, people like Jason would like to say still who have like, you know, real jobs and like, who the hell are these people? I don't care. Just move on. You know, and Reverend Harrison was out trying to keep people alive. Mm-hmm. He was know. praying for them. Yeah. Me. Yeah, I, got, hard. I got time to kill. <laughs> 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 you know what? I'm going to take the bait. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the yeah. thing. Like, you would think that the local black community mm-hmm. would would look at Abdul, a man who came to Indianapolis 13 years ago and has started a successful publication who is a teacher, a lawyer, a thought leader, a sought th- after thought, to come speak. You know, you you are somebody who gives back. You sp- your whole career is giving back to this community, a mm-hmm. community that you don't even consider yourself a part of. You still oh. have Illinois license plates for oh, God's I sake. I still have an Illinois home, right? For a word, because <laughs> number one, I don't. I'm really get off on a tangent here. Okay, I'm like Dr. Noonan soon in Star Trek. I don't believe in living anywhere without a well thought out escape plan. Because you never know when the giant crystalline Emily snowflake is going to come and kill everybody on the planet. You have you have been married for eight years. You have no escape. Oh, are... oh, yes, I do. You got the it's, hand. It's a beautiful. It's a beautiful woman. But you know what? You never know when they crazy is going to kick in. <laughs> oh, it's inevitable. Yeah, got and right. that's why I do nothing without a well thought out escape. Plan. It's now, like Nova King. Just takes time. Escape. Right. I have a. I have a. I have a. Trust me. I have several doomsday scenarios that we are ready and prepared for. <laughs> but is, is, is there a wife insurance? Like, there's a Sean Hannity food insurance. <laughs> yeah, it's called a lawyer. That's My wife would never leave me because she can program the DVR. <laughs> it's true. But you you are somebody who gives back to this community tremendously. You've started a business that now makes you a decent income and is just at, you're at the forefront of thought leadership. It's just not their thought. Right. Yeah. And that has always been – I've had to deal with that basically pretty much all my adult life. Since right. coming back to the United States. Sure. Because uh, we lived in Europe for a while, as you know. Came back here in 1990 to finish school and do some other things. And I went to, my dad kind of gave me the talk before I got on the plane and left. It's like, okay, son, I want you to think about this. Harry, you, I don't know if you ever had your father or you know, male figure do this. Son, I had a father. It's okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you just never know. It's, yeah. rare. it's rare. I know. Yeah, you never know people sit Yeah, I know my daddy. You know, so does my brother, my other brother, my other brother, my other brother. <laughs> Papa's a Rolling Stone. <laughs> yeah, 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 it was. Yeah. Still, still finding us brothers and sisters mm-hmm. around the country. And when he died, all he left us was alone. <laughs> yeah, Harry's not kidding. <laughs> Big one. <laughs> no, but it was my father's. Like, okay, son, I understand you got your political beliefs and philosophy, and you know. We've been, we've been in Europe, and you had a very diverse group of friends, but I'd appreciate it, your mother and I, if you just make an effort. <laughs> Meaning what? Like, Dad, what are you talking about? You know what I mean, son. Just, you know, maybe revisit your people. Just, just... <laughs> your dad called you an Uncle Tom? <laughs> no, my dad was like sort of, like, son, just, just make an effort to... Just, you know, what <laughs> on <laughs> earth? Put an extra packet of sugar in the Kool-Aid. Is that what he's saying? <laughs> well, more like... You know, try some Miracle Whip. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, just sort of just sort of that. But A little bit of spice, yeah. some zest. <laughs> yeah, like I'm not saying I don't mind you playing so much in the snow, but you ever thought about just getting a part-time job in a coal mine? <laughs> <laughs> you know, did you... Was that dating advice for that particular? In, in, in a certain amount of way. <laughs> yeah, you met my father before. Oh, absolutely. Just very staunch, you know, very quiet. Law and order. Law and order, yes. yeah. Law and order kind of down. No so, nonsense. Yeah, I just wish you... Which is why, why it's so stunning he would say that to you. Mm, no, not really, because I understand my, my, parents, my parents' upbringing. Because my dad was born in the 1930s. And for most of his adult life, he had to deal with a bunch of crap that none of us could possibly Ever, yeah. imagine. It was perfectly yeah. legal, and there was nothing he could do about it. Did, did they grow up in Chicago, in the city? My parents grew up in the South, but eventually, during the migration, okay. came north. Right. So, I mean, my dad served in Korea shortly after the Korean War. He comes back in Chicago, 19... 19- 59 to get a job as an accountant because mm-hmm. that's what his college degree was in. He's going through the Chicago Tribune newspaper, see the wanted ad, accountants wanted, blah, 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 blah. By the way, colors need not apply. I mean, yeah. A little bit different yeah, than that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 You, you don't see EEOC opportunity at the bottom of the ad. I mean. how, how do you, how do you, um, 
because I know you have there's younger generations in your family. I mean, how do you communicate that? Because I, I like watching that girl's reaction to the news story yesterday. I thought, man, I understand why a Colin Kaepernick is born, and I understand why there is a sense of in- inequality. Because even though it isn't no colored supply anymore, there still is, you know there still is fear like if i get pulled over i get a nice 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 day have have a good day harry thinks i may not make it through this alive you got interviewed by the secret service yeah. and we're not nervous <laughs> right he exactly. was afraid to bring a gun to a podcast right yeah. you see but it's so very, see, yeah, it's white privilege you see but but each of our experiences are totally different because someone will always ask me abdul have you ever been pulled over by the police because you're black i can honestly say i don't know mm-hmm. and the main reason why all my adult life i've been in the media business sure mm-hmm. So as a television or radio reporter or you know, political operative figure, so I've always known the law enforcement and the community where I was. Yeah, you've, already, you've been a member of the government, cl- the political class. Yeah, the political yes. class forever. It's, it's totally different. So, see, so, so here's the PSA from Abdul to every black man. Get to know the police chief yes. on a first-name basis. Yes. Get a yeah. cell phone. Get a cell phone number. <laughs> yeah. That's what. Yeah, that's why I'm not so afraid in Lawrence. It's when I leave Lawrence because I know Lawrence PD. I know the Lawrence police officers. I hang out with them. I know where we they hang out. We went to school, but you I mean yeah. it's like with but, the, you know yeah. that type of thing. You it's, at this point, they're at the stage of their career where they're the law enforcement. Mm-hmm. Now it's not too much that like I, uh, that I think I get pulled over because I'm black. I've drove through Carmel tons of times. Never got pulled over because I was freaking black. I get pulled over because I'm speedy. But the main thing that makes me really worried is because when the police officer, before he knows me at all, all he can see is like statistics. Like okay, I've got a Six foot large black man in a car. It's kind of dark in there, you know. See, but a, I would uh, see, but I would argue now it's a perfect time to be a black driver. Yeah, because <laughs> everybody is afraid of a lawsuit. It reverses. It's, like, it's like it's like get on the plane the day after a big crash. <laughs> <laughs> if there was ever a day that you know United and Southwest is going to have their shit together, it mm-hmm. is after the big DC ten <laughs> mm-hmm. crash. So right. you know what? I just go through Carmel playing public enemy. Fuck the police. <laughs> <laughs> Do straight out of Compton. Just drive around the roundabout. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's going to stop. Not me today. <laughs> Screaming Dale. Uh, now, I'll tell you this. You got that until the jury verdict. Then, <laughs> <laughs> after you yeah. found out guilty, you might want to be a little take a little different approach. Oh, uh, well, yeah, because with the stupors, he saw my Glock on my... He didn't ask for a Glock. He didn't even ask for my permit. just asked for my ID. He just asked for, like, uh, uh, my papers. But... When uh, when my wife, when she got pulled over in Carmel, right, going through the roundup, they pulled her out of the car, took her gun, unloaded her gun. I know, white girl at 3 a.m. in, you know, Carmel. You know, they pulled her out. But, you know, but that's that's what... Well, did you have a picture of you on the dash? <laughs> <laughs> no, no but, but also, but see, but here's the thing I think sometimes people forget, is when we look at African-American police encounters, we have to look at things in context, mm-hmm. in the total mm-hmm. and complete picture of what's going on. Right, for everything's example, case by case. For, for yeah. example, the Aaron Bailey police action yes. shooting that everybody's going on. Uh, Explain uh, that. Uh, here in Indianapolis, back in June, uh, we had a situation where police pulled over a guy and a girl about 2 o'clock in the morning on the near north by northwest side. Mm-hmm. Nine minutes through the police stop, the guy takes off, leads the police on a two-mile high-speed chase. And not like a straight chase down the street, but like smoking the band. It makes a left turn here. You know, right turn here, another left turn here, and then get stopped by a tree. Crossing medians. <laughs> but, yeah, by a tree. yeah, he gets stopped by a tree and hits a tree. But then we're, this is where it gets unclear because we're not sure exactly sure what happened. The cops get out. You know, there are words exchanged and there are shots fired through the back of the vehicle. Mr. Bailey is killed. Now, we don't know exactly if all the shots came from one gun, if they came from both guns, where the officers were. But you have people saying that Aaron Bailey was assassinated. Like, really? Seriously? Yeah. JFK and Martin Luther King got it. Now, this is the Southport police officer, right? Uh, no, this is yeah. IMPD. Okay, all right. Yeah. And so... You're really the only news outlet that's paid at the level of detail and attention to it that exists. Everyone else either picked their default side, and that was that. So, I, well, my position has always been, just get all the facts. Right. I have never said mm-hmm. that the Mr. Bailey was guilty or that the cops were innocent. I was like, you know what? How about we just get all the facts and then take it... From there, people are like, no, we want the cops charged with murder. But you can't charge somebody with murder until you have enough probable cause for a murder charge. Because newsflash, and the the people who are saying the cops committed murder, they point to Aaron Bailey being shot in the back, and the bullets came from the back. That shows that it was murder. But Mr. Bailey also had, if I remember the toxicology reports correctly, he had cocaine and stimulants in his system. Mm. Hi. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Have, have we met? And so... It's context, and I will still maintain in my dying day had Mr. Bailey not – when Mr. Bailey fled the scene, this turned – this would escalate it to an entirely different level. Well, yeah. yeah. Because you take off in the car during the traffic stop. Correct. We're not saying the cops pull up to the corner. Everybody kind of runs and scatters, and mm-hmm. then cops start, you know, open season. Right. Mm-hmm. No, but during a traffic stop, 
lawful stop, you take off and drive. You've now escalated this to a whole different level, and mm -hmm. you bear some responsibility for the consequences that are about to ensue. And mm -hmm. you've when, created when, a public threat. Right, because yeah, you, you might hit blood. someone else. Yeah, when you trade. got pulled over, did you take off? Oh, no. Go yeah, good. No, and no. you know what? That's why you're still here. <laughs> I pulled over, turned on the interior lights. <laughs> yeah. Had my, you know, papers ready and just sat there. No, right. now some people will say that. Good morning, Mr. Officer. Would you like a period? <laughs> is there a problem, officer? Uh, yeah. This is my wife, Lacey. Yeah. <laughs> no, but but there, there's some people say that uh, you know African Americans shouldn't have to talk to their sons about you know encounters with the police and how to stay alive, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to say to a certain degree, you're right, but you should have that conversation. I mean, my father, we grew up in Chicago, made it perfectly clear. Matter of fact, we grew up on a military base. He's like, if there is a problem or an issue. Do not argue with law enforcement. Just go quietly. Yes, sir. No, sir. If, well, you, and if you have to go, <clears throat> go. Call me, and then we will take care of it. Because you do not get into an argument with somebody who has the legal authority to arrest, detain, and, if necessary, shoot you. Yeah, and that's yeah, what yeah. – and, and just to you in just a second, Harry. But that's what Michael Bennett's attorney said. Michael Bennett hired a, a civil rights attorney – who is going to sue the Las Vegas Police Department for being wrongfully uh, for being assaulted? And the the lawyer basically said, you, "You the the time to have the discussion about your rights is not in that moment with the police officer. It is when you are sitting in the jail cell or after. It is not in that moment because the reality for most people, but in especially young black men, is that if if you are trying to explain your rights." goes back to the axiom that Abdul has taught me. If you are explaining, you are losing. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, so, <laughs> and there's nothing they hate more than you know, being told how to do their job. And yeah. even if you do point out a flaw they might have done in the Miranda process... They're not letting you go. When, when I, oh, that was my fault. I didn't read you your rights. You're, you're good. I, I should know them unless you're cool with them. They're like, oh, okay, yeah, okay, I see what I did there. But they're going to go ahead and do it, then apologize later. Well, yeah. I, I got, yeah. like I said, I got pulled over going very much over the speed limit uh, <laughs> about two months ago, mm -hmm. and I got off with a warning. And it's because I didn't pull the, uh, am I free to go, officer? Am I being detained? Like Bittner wanted me to. I was on the way to the last pool yeah. party. I was on the way to the last pool party, and Bittner gave me shit when I got there because he's like, um, you didn't employ the five ACLU steps to blah, blah. I'm like, no, and that's why I got out of the ticket because when I he said, do you know why I pulled you over? I said, I didn't. I didn't make a word. I just kind of went. I don't know. I was driving around a roundabout repeatedly, blaring <laughs> NWA. Right, yeah. I didn't know but, I could do that, officer. I, and <laughs> and I was polite. I was prepared. And I just and I just and he goes, uh, go on. I I, I was like. And I said, was, a lot of times, what people forget is when we when you're dealing with law enforcement in that situation, how you decide to escalate the situation. Law enforcement is going to escalate it and try to match you sometimes tone. Right. For tone, you start yelling and screaming, and a lot of officers are like, you know, ma'am, sir, you have to calm down, step out of the car. People That's naturally mirror each other. Well, yeah, right. Yeah. That's why you stay polite. Yes, officer. No, officer. Is there a problem, officer? You know, Mr. Shabazz, you know why I pulled you over? Oh, I thought the dead body in the trunk. <laughs> yeah, I, I never admit wrongdoing to anything, mm -hmm. but I'm always very polite. I never, now, you know. Now, sometimes if it's just blatantly obvious, yeah, yeah, I know, I was speeding. I shouldn't have been. Right. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you for admitting it. Just drive a little care. Be careful next time, mm -hmm. because the cops don't. Some because believe it or not, cops don't want the hassle. Right. Yeah. You know, they just want to go home to their families. Right. Go mm -hmm. do their shift and go home. They want to go watch YouTube videos on the laptop like we want to in the middle of our work day, right? right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they sit in the parking lot and watch these videos, yeah. Go ahead, Harry. Oh, uh, well, the, the thing is what I also want to get to is, uh, like uh, that talk with the, the police officers, I had the same talk with my dad. My dad told me the same one is because, you know, growing up, I watched those cop block videos and watched them like, yeah, they're shoving cameras in front of these cops' face. I want to do that, too. And my dad was like, no, 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 no. You'll no, do no. it once, and then you'll never do it again. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what you can do, uh, because there's actually a state law that allows you to do it, and Congressman Jim Banks authored it. Uh, based on something he got from some libertarians, which was you can film police officers as mm -hmm. long as you do not interfere Correct. with the officers doing his or her job. Yeah, yeah. current Congressman but, Jim Banks, that's here in Indiana, and he he's now Marlon Stutzman. Yeah, he's now in the third district here from mm -hmm. Indiana in the in the federal Congress. 
Go ahead, Harry. Oh, yeah, which which is cool because you can sit there and you can record the conversation. But what a lot of people, which um, I don't like what a lot of cop blockers or people film the cops do, is they when they put that camera up and they start shouting at that police officer their rights, which they do have, is that they also forget the humanity of that police officer. They're sh- shouting at someone who's trying to do their job. So they're, like, accusing a lot of cops of forgetting their humanity, but they're doing the same thing. Exactly. They're shouting at the abstraction of all police officers, yeah. not that individual officer that lives in the community and shot at Walgreens, Mm -hmm. you know, and it really just doesn't, like Abdul said, they don't want the hassle. It's paperwork that, you know, then if it it ends up being a violation, they get brought in to testify and take depositions. Right after Donald Trump got elected, uh, you guys remember this, there was a big protest rally in downtown Indianapolis, and just all the people yelling and screaming about Trump, and so I was supposed to go to dinner that night, meet my brother, I was like, hey, I got to go downtown, all the cops are down there, so I got to go do my day job. And it was actually the time I discovered how to use Facebook Live, so it was great. <laughs> right. So there was the one girl who was, you know, got the cops lined up, you got all these people yelling and screaming at him. And there was this one literally little white girl snowflake who's just standing there with her sign and stared at the officer. And I was like, um, so I got my recorder out, like, excuse me, miss, I'd like to know why you're here. Could you tell me your name? My name isn't important. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So brave. <laughs> okay, well, mm-hmm. could you at least tell me why you're here? I'm here standing for justice. Okay, whatever. Okay, why are you standing at the police officer? I want him to acknowledge me. Well, I think he knows you're here. Right. Because the cop's on horseback, and they're all just yelling and screaming and everything, and the cop's just exercising all the restraint in the universe. So the one actually smacked my hand and knocked my recorder on the ground. The cop's like, do you want us to arrest her? Really? Because <laughs> they like, that's battery. We'll, we'll arrest her if you want us to. <laughs> And Can you imagine the story that would run? Abdul gets beat up by quivering snowflake. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, no, I mean, she just, uh, she smacks it. It's like, okay, do I smack the shit out of you? Because technically you did just attack me. Right. And I don't know what you're about to do next. She violated your nap. You, yeah. you have full right to attack her. Yeah, and so the, cop, and the cops were there. They're watching the whole thing, and they were, like, kind of excited. They're like, finally, there's one. Right. <laughs> that isn't good. <laughs> They're I, I, waiting for that provocation. No, no, but, no, but, no because the, they have been exercising just a ton of self-restraint, and you got these 19- and 20-year-olds just yelling and screaming at you who don't know dick, you know, from day one, who, who have this romanticized view of the 1960s or, or whatever that They're is. They're pissed they yeah. missed the Civil Rights Movement and yeah. the hate Ashbury Movement. Yeah, even though they have no idea what it's like to have a hose turn on you and dogs. Right. <laughs> yeah. Can you no. imagine trying to keep the horse still while being yelled at by all those people, though? When you're sitting on top of the horse and being yelled at. So you're trying to keep the horse still, trying to keep the horse <laughs> calm, and you're just getting yelled at. I That's tell somebody, true. hey, do me a favor. Run that restaurant and grab me a white napkin. We're about to have some fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Was that a hood reference? Yes, it was. For our slower, the slower <laughs> member of our audiences. Uh, now, y- yeah, I... <sighs> Uh, you don't want, you know, Im- Damn it, put holes in these things so we can see through them next time. <laughs> now, listen, <laughs> nobody's saying they don't appreciate what Marsha did. <laughs> it's one of the best scenes in yeah. Django Unchained. Ever. Uh, yeah. uh, but, next time, Hoods. <laughs> but, but I want to go back to the question of the younger members of your family because there is that romanticized ver- vision of the 60s, but you being somebody who is. Now, see, Abdul, this is not a real radio station, so we have a cat that jumps up on this table. And she likes to put her asshole towards the camera right in the middle of the show. So I apologize. We used to do that too, and we. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. Every time Mayor Peterson came in, I uh, just showed him my asshole. Don't worry, it's a sign of respect, Mayor. Yes. <laughs> so put that down, please. Weaponized assholes on the table <laughs> on this podcast. Now, so you had the benefit of having a father who could say to you, uh, "Focus, Harry. I know there's an asshole in your face." You had the benefit of a father who could relate the 1930 story of No Colors Applied. Right. And so that is impactful for you, but how do you pass that from generation to generation? Actually, it's quite easy. And, under, and, and get them to understand. And we did this during the, during the presidential election. My father voted for Donald Trump. Yes. He surprised me. Actually, it didn't surprise me because I asked him, well, I asked him, Dad, well, why did you? I had a theory. He was like, son, because Trump is going to bring these jobs back so these young brothers can get to work. Hmm. So total bring the jobs back from overseas. And that is, the, that is the crux of you know what his worldview is: is that economic op- the a lack of like lower uh, hmm. entry level economic opportunity is the, the largest driving force behind all this discontent. It's I'm, primarily an economic one because it's it, primarily out. uneducated people who yeah. didn't bother getting education now reaping the consequences of their actions. Right, yeah. and then, so what they do is they say, well, I can go to an attempt agency and try to find the worst kind of work I can find that's you know no real ladder up unless I show an initiative, which 
for the most part, isn't on there. Or maybe should have got your lazy ass off out of bed and went to school. They are, but a lot of times it's too late in the process to just all of a sudden about yeah. face. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What My do you wife went back. Yeah. What do you mean? My wife went back to school at 40. Oh, no, no. I mean, I like, just back. Yeah. if you try to tell that to somebody in that moment while they're trying, they're desperate and trying to find employment, but they feel like that they're, you know, getting a raw deal, they're going to go. You're getting, you're getting the deal that you, you're the one who dealt the cards by making choices. But why, yeah. but oh, I agree. Yeah. It's just how do you deal? That's the reality, yeah. but the, the real question is, how do you fix it so you don't just create a well, resistance? Let, let me, well, let me answer, answer his question first, and then I'll yeah. deal with the Antifa, alt-right, Splenda, Propecia group people. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> may cause bleeding and irritating. And <laughs> the enormous ir- pricks that are yeah. medically created. Yes, yeah, so it may be called irritable bowel syndrome. Yeah. Yeah, tell me about it. Right. It's a good meme No, there. like I said, <laughs> what I, what I had, the conversation I had, because my 20-year-old niece was kind of mouthing off to my dad, and like, I can't believe blah, 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 blah. I was like, well, young lady, newsflash. I want you to understand something. For the first 35 years of your grandfather's life, he couldn't vote. If he had stayed where he, him and his grandmother, where your grandmother grew up, they could not vote until like 1964. Sure. You know, and still vote. then, it was and then you were risking something. Yeah, it did with poll yeah. taxes. Your great grandfather, who you didn't know because he died before you were born, couldn't vote for the first 65 years yeah. of mm-hmm. his entire life. And newsflash. There was nothing he can do about it. No. So you, young lady, need to shut the fuck up. Because the test that even allowed him to take it, yeah. they have had PhD students try to take those tests today, and they can't pass yeah. them. And so by doing that, I just said, like, you know, that's, and that's the end of this discussion. And she accepted that or no? Yep. Did she? Because I'm Uncle Abdul. I don't put up with that crap. Okay. But did, did, has it affected her worldview, or has she? Has it changed her stance on it? Yeah, well, her worldview will change like most young people's worldview change when they move out and get a job. It will. Yeah. But... Is that something you've noticed, though? Because I don't know that I've necessarily watched. If you look at this last election. At the, at the, at the end of the day, there is nothing new under the sun. There is I a, mean, the, the 1960s radical hippies all became, you know, John Reagan. They, they all became Reagan. Oh, or half of them became Reaganites. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, they all started. There's, a, there's an old cartoon strip called Bloom County, which used to read all the time when I was a little kid. Very political back in the 1980s. And it was a comic strip where it's like these two hippies that are sitting at a bar. You can tell they were like the... You know, the baby boomer, a little bit of long hair, and the one guy says, "Hey, Mel, remember that book we talked about? You know, socialist dis- redistribution of wealth in the in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts." Yeah. Well, I broke out. I was like, "Why don't I write a book about it?" So I, so I broke out the old Royal typewriter that I bought in '64 <laughs> and cranked it out, and it's now it's a bestseller. My accountant says, "With Reagan's new tax code, I'll save forty thousand dollars this year." <laughs> <laughs> What's a liberal to do? Yeah, no, and, one, and one of the Bloom County characters says, "Hey, order me another drink and put it on his tab." <laughs> No, they all went and got rich, and and I found the the easiest way to get people to change their mind is when they start making money. Yeah. All that other stuff goes out the way. Here's mm-hmm. a movie. If you haven't seen it, go rent it. Uh, or actually, you should be able to find it on Netflix or uh, on YouTube. I'm going to get you, sucker. Oh, it's a Keenan Ivory Wayne's film, and you'll know what I'm talking about because it's, it's who a, are they? It's, it's a it's a base. It's based on those old Such black exploitation great. films of the 70s, right? Where the, where the guy goes away to the army, comes back home, neighborhoods run by the gang members, so he. Go finds a group of Vietnam vets or whatever, and they. It's like kick Walking off. Tall with the Rock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Basically, Walking Tall is a is an ex- is a, based on old black exploitation. Yeah, films. the remake. Yeah. And so, early in the film, the guy Keen Ivory Wayne's who comes back from the army, the whole neighborhood is like shot to hell. So he goes to like the Black Liberation Army place, <laughs> right? And the guy comes out, and first of all, his wife is Jan Brady. <laughs> <laughs> He's got all these pictures of Malcolm X and Stokely Carmichael and Elders Cleaver on the wall. <laughs> And then he says, hey, would you like something to eat? Like a bean pie, which is you know, even more <laughs> yeah. subtle right. humor. Yeah. And so the so Keenan Ivory Wayne says, I don't understand. Like, you know, can you go with me down to, you know, help me take back the neighborhood? And he was like, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Like, well, what happened? The Black People's Liberation Army was 10,000 strong. It's like, well, remember that day we went down the storm of the government building? Yeah. They were hiring that day. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what? Yeah, they were hiring. The brothers wanted justice. They walked away with jobs. <laughs> right. <laughs> that white man is something else. <laughs> <laughs> and it's satire, but you know what? There's kind of a lot of truth. And that's true, though. But the question is, will that, ma- will that hold? Because yeah. I yeah. think that economic growth is what fueled a lot of those gains. If you look at our economy and the way that it's situated right now, it's much more turning into dividing up the pie for your, whatever group you represent. But the, but the thing is, with economic growth, I will argue the problem is we're looking at too much, too many things at a global level. You got to look at it individually, mm-hmm. because I will argue if you want to control your economic growth, what skill set do you have? Mm-hmm. Period. 
Mm-hmm. If you guys are you guys went ahead and you developed We Are Libertarians podcast, right? Making money off of it. You know, you have the the pay part and the open part. You took an idea and oh my god, capitalism. Right. You no. Know, found a way against to all it. odds, people yeah. found us worthy of listening to. We, yes. we, we spent five. We spent five and a half years, and you can argue I've spent fifteen years trying to hone some skills, and then it's just now, after fifteen years, that I'm able to monetize those. Yeah. You know, and it's not like we're making money. We're making money, but we're putting it right back into the product and trying to, to grow, improve grow the product and make more money. Exactly. Delayed right. gratification, which is rare today. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I argue the exact same thing. You know, if I take the time, you know, learn my proper IT or whatever, and I can develop an app, I can sell a million bucks. Mm-hmm. I mean, how did Uber start as an idea? Democratization mm-hmm. of the cab industry. Right. Mm-hmm. People got tired of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, when was the last time you went to a you know a travel agent? Mm-hmm. Oh, exactly. <laughs> or right. a bank teller. You know, because technology has years. changed all that. I, th- I think what you're seeing and what part of the economic anxiety is, is because, uh, okay, for, the, for those of you who are listening, there, there's an old movie uh, done around uh, in the 1920s, remember it from film school. It was about these French soldiers in a German prison camp. And they were kind of divided by class. So the enlisted men, they had to eat in the mess hall, but the officers got to eat with the German officers. Mm-hmm. And the French colonel and the German colonel, they had their own, like, private dining area. They ate together, they ate dinner every night. Because this is, like, you know, gentlemanly... Very civilized. Real civilized rules of yeah. war. Right. Mm-hmm. And Very European, actually. Yeah, and so the French soldier is talking... The French colonel is talking to the German colonel. And he says, don't you think it's interesting that, you know, our men are blah, 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 blah. Meanwhile, we have this fine, like, pheasant under glass. And the German commander says something I'll never forget. It just goes to prove what I've always said. The world is not divided like this. It's divided like this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely is. It all, it all, and, and it always has been. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you, you, Meaning it's not horiz- it's horizontal. It's not perpendicular. Right. You know. Yeah, it's not black, white. It's income. Well, it hasn't yes. been, but don't, I feel like that's absolutely changing in the United States. I feel like, the re- the, I th- feel like people's perception is changing. Like they feel like that uh, th- we see it as, as economic because as libertarians, as individualists. I've always as, seen it as economic, as but now econ- I'm seeing it as race. But I, well, I, you, because people are making it more racial. I mean, correct, yeah. it's, because the people that have been in power are no longer the in, like. If you saw for the first time in American history, forty three percent of white of um, or white Christians are the minority for the first time in American yes! history. Spartacus. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the, but this last the, election, the Democratic Party for the first time ever. The majority of their voters were not white individuals. But if you look at it economically, I will take you down to the Beach Grove Walmart, Mm -hmm. and I will show you a bunch of whiteies that I'd love to send back to whatever country. Maybe Ireland will take them, and then and then replace them with the dreamer, the dreamer kids. I mean, like if you talk about economics, the 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 DACA kids that we're discussing right now, eight hundred thousand. They bring in sixty billion dollars to the United States. Oh yeah, and and, and, and people forget. I have to correct some people on Facebook. Imagine that the hoops that you have to jump through to become a DACA kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not yeah. just a form. Yeah. yeah, it's not just a form. You know, you had to finish high school, have a GED, be mm-hmm. enrolled in college. You had to be here before 2007. So you had Demonstrate to be here. a bunch of traits that right. indicate you're on a good path. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I trade your life for a green card. Yeah. Only you can prove that you have a skill that no regular American has. That is easily acceptable. <laughs> My favorite line from Coneheads. <laughs> <laughs> when I got pulled out of college and started working for a small business, uh, the... I was, you know, like, I got to be in charge of all these, basically, like, the people who would be in the DACA program, mm-hmm. and they schooled me, because I had nothing but, like, you know, nothing but education. Just you like, had credentials, and they right. had experience. Yeah, they had experience, and I got schooled so hard. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, that's that's the, that. but it's shaping up, though. It, it certainly appears to be that well, way. Well, the me. question yeah, it, it, it's almost the, the analogy I use for, for what you're saying is, I look at it like this, like, and, the, and the hurricanes, Harvey and uh, Irma bring to mind. The question is, are the hurricanes getting worse? Or are we build in places that we normally didn't build before, and now we're seeing more damage mm-hmm. because we yeah. think we're just arrogant enough that we control our own fate. We can even, you know, handle natural disaster to yeah. a certain to a certain degree. You know, when you start building places where normally it'd be like out west, then there's a fire. We're like, oh my god, look at all these horrible fires! Well, the fires have actually always kind of been happening. You just now live there. Mm-hmm. You just wanted a lake home in a place yeah. where people didn't build. Right, exactly. Right, there's yeah. a reason why it's called a floodplain yeah. because it. Fucking floods. Floods. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. crazy. So that's why I argue, you know, we talk about quote unquote economic anxiety. It's always been there. Mm-hmm. I mean, go back to your 1970s when we started seeing, uh, you know, the whole shift in how we do manufacturing. A hundred years ago, my grandfather, all he needed was a strong back and a strong work ethic, and he just moved boxes from one end of the factory to the other. We were the only, you know, major production power, industrial power right. after 30, World War II. Yeah. 30 years later, my uncle, his son, drives a forklift. I can move more boxes, so I don't need as many people. Sure. Mm-hmm. Another 30 years later, 
his son operates the crane that moves the boxes. And his now, son's going to be the supply chain and now, manager. And now his son, it. yeah, his son. Now his son is going to be the guy at the main headquarters running the computer that runs the cranes in like ten factories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The automated workforce. The automated workforce. Correct, yeah. And the chal- And the problem is, particularly for unskilled labor is these are the people who are being, so to speak, mechanized out of a job. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The uh, Back uh, during the presidential debates, during the Democrat and Republican, because I'm a total dork, I think I might have told you, I was sitting home watching C-SPAN 3. <laughs> and, uh, okay. not, not one, not two, no, but and this, three. this naked libertarian came yeah. on stage. I don't know what the hell happened. <laughs> Actually, I was doing the Indy 500. That's the scary part. Uh, yeah. During C-SPAN 3, and it was the... Uh, Democratic presidential debate of 1960 in West Virginia mm-hmm. between John F. Kennedy and, and, and Hubert Humphrey. Oh, and Humphrey? No, no, this is the Democratic debate. Oh, the so primaries. We haven't got to the, to the primaries yet. We've yeah. done the primaries. And the question was, and I will never forget this, remember, just like it was yesterday, you know, Senator Nixon, or Senator Kennedy, Senator Humphrey, you know, one of the big questions right now is with the advances in manufacturing and machines doing more and more work, what is your plan to help the displaced, skilled American worker who is losing his job to a machine? That was almost 60 years ago. Oh, absolutely. Right. What's changed? It's the story of mankind is creative destruction, you know, and how do they still I w- participate economically when they have to start from the beginning? Yep. I, yeah. was at the, I was at the library the other day, and uh, I, if you go to the library still, they're just now switching to a magnetic system. So, <laughs> so when, you, when you walk out, you, just, you don't have to put the cards in. But if you check out a library book at the Indianapolis Library, for right now, you still have the pocket, and you've got to put one of those little due date cards in the pocket. Oh, my and God. And that keeps the alarm from going off when you walk it's out. It's like they're Amish. They could just put an RFID in there. And I'm just... to a database once you scan it in. Well, that's what they're doing. And, but it takes time because they have tens of... Uh, hundreds of thousands of books. And so... What? They're... So... I'm looking at this going, what, what about this poor lithograph company that makes all these cards? They must be panicking. Can you imagine if you worked at the card company? And, and you were, and, and say you were 57, <laughs> and you couldn't afford to retire yet, but you, know, you, but you didn't know what the hell you were going to go do but, for but, the next 10 years before you could. We love the negative, sad story because we, wanna, we empathize with those people, but we don't take a look at the other end of the spectrum and go okay well the rfid sticker company is displacing those workers and that new technology but that's in japan and north korea or in south korea yeah that's the that's the that's what caused trump's election Mm -hmm. that exactly right there is yes creative destruction is great we all benefit as consumers from globalization Mm -hmm. but then if you dis if you um eventually what happens the displaced workers become a big enough voting block that they listen to a madman, and that is what happened completely in in the, the blue dog Democrat districts all across the country that were more rural. Well, actually, they listened to a madman. They also had somebody that nobody liked. Yeah, oh, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. The dynamics you, yeah, of the race. You, you are the most unpopular, yeah. two most unpopular people, you know, in American mm-hmm. history. Like this is it. And one yeah. just decided that he was going to take up a cause for enough of the other side's traditional voting base that it worked. Mm-hmm. Yep. In the right district. I argue any other Democrat, and it's a whole different ballgame. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. If Absolutely. you run Joe Biden, it's the biggest <laughs> electoral route since Reagan. Yep. Sure. And you said today, no matter how uh, – because I asked, when did, when did Trump start looking presidential? And you said, uh, you know, no matter how unpopular Donald Trump gets. Hillary Clinton's approval rating to this day is still lower than Donald Trump's. Which is amazing. It's yeah. stunning. I mean, yeah. she actually makes George W. Bush look like Gandhi. <laughs> and what she did to the uh, Democratic Party is like watching it splinter, watching all these Democrats just like freak out about it, like at least for the national. Well, level, the political anyways. parties, like what we're seeing is just the phenomenon so, is just the breakdown of the existing or the the, the model that both parties used. Yeah. Republicans were see, conservative. Nobody, nobody, should have, which, nobody should have expected this model to last forever. No, because even the Democratic Republican Party, as we know, used to be the Democrat Republican Party. Right, right. And then they had to split. Over a whole slavery issue, and the Whigs mm-hmm. became the Republicans. Did, did, did anybody still remember Whigs? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because Thomas Jefferson would not be a big government progressive in the Democratic Party ever. Nope, that, he was antithetical to that that you know line of thinking. Mm-hmm. And yet they love to trot him out as their you know th- their most brilliant mind that's ever inhabited their party. My favorite movie is still though Jefferson in Paris when Sherman Hemsley. Right, and Louisy, go yeah. to the Apple Tower. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that does say a lot, though, because the parties radic- they had to change because their model no longer worked with slavery. That became the the issue that caused them to 
to split and American politics to change. And I think what you're seeing is the Republican Party traditionally has been philosophical. That's their thought, that they are a conservative, philosophically driven party. The Democrats are transactional. The coalitions don't break rank. They hold together with the expectation they'll get there when it's their time. And everybody remains in solidarity. Now you're seeing a total kind of reversal because of the evaporation of unionized labor. And that voting bloc now switching over more along racial lines to the Republican Party, who, if you watch Donald Trump this week, he sounds to the left of Bill Clinton, wildly left. Well, something also to keep in mind, too, uh, with respect to my Republican friends, they've only won the popular vote one time since 1992. Oh, yeah. The it's Republican ideas aren't popular. They're popular until your Social Security gets cut. Well, the problem with Republican ideas, I will argue they are better in the sense when we talk about economic growth and stability – the problem is, is when you start, well, where is the president's birth certificate? Oh, my God, really? Well, yeah, the Duck Dynasty phenomenon within yeah. the GOP. It, right. But that's a testament to how it's changing because that's the voting base that allows them to rewrite the industrial Midwest in the Electoral College. Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing Paul Ryan, small gov you know, theoretically small government conservatives, all of a sudden their ideas aren't, don't speak to the people internally, and it's things like DACA. You know, it's it's those it's the cultural preservation. It's the popu right wing populism is. The and what, I wish somebody would tell me what this cultural you know preservation is. It's racism. Oh, I it's, don't get that. It's literally that he and I are better than you two. It's white identity mm -hmm. politics. Because, because what it, it is. sounds to me, that sounds a lot like family value. It is. It's yeah. Pat Buchanan. About, it sounds like family. It sounds like it's 1992 all over again, and I'm watching the Pat Buchanan speech at the Republican National Convention. And I'm thinking to myself. I remember this in German. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's very true. It, it is not on such a, like a, in an in overt a, scale. In the 1970s, it was, I'm for law and order. Right. You know, you're soft on crime. You don't want to be soft on crime, do you? Right. Because <laughs> well, well, you know what soft on crime means? You can let all those black people out of jail. Look, it's Willie Horton. Remember the Democratic Convention in 68. I'm just going to be honest, Abdul. Every white girl I know wants to date a black man. Kind of had a point. Cat loves Harry more than she loves us. She makes things easier. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I and now the the catchphrase is preserve culture, preserve hair. Not even heritage, but we have to protect Western civilization. Well, did you hear about whatever that? Did you hear about, about Reed College? Reed College, their most prominent dropout, Steve Jobs. It's where he went and like learned calligraphy and the Mac typeface. But they are now under a, an assault for mandating Western Civ as a class for all freshmen. Because that is forcing that is racist. Because it's it's prioritizing Western Civ as a requirement over the, the Eastern, any other Eastern development. Civ? Of, right. Yeah. So the idea is you shouldn't have to study Plato because their ideas are irrelevant. It's that well, they are why thought, you don't have to come here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> but I mean, other places you can go and never touch Plato. This is the one of the most mm. liberal institutions mm. in the country in Oregon. I mean, for Steve Jobs like. Ate apple. He went on an all apple diet when they were there. You pick your own major. You can take calligraphy and all these different. Weird and somebody things. who teaches. Here's what I tell my students on the first day, ladies and gentlemen. I do not believe in safe spaces because real life is not a safe space. Mm -hmm. Oh, you would get. You are a walking nightmare for any public institution you're ever attached to. <laughs> yep. And you know what? Schools like thank you, Abdul. We appreciate it because yeah. I, because I'm on television, radio, and I'm a lawyer. And I tell my students, you want to argue, feel free. But I do this for a living, and you will lose, and you will lose poorly. I had, a, I had a cousin who had him as a professor. He was very irritating because he's always right. And it's, it's why I'm a libertarian is because he's always right. <laughs> That's true. You were dyed in the wool rush baby. I go back and I listen to the 2007-2008 episodes and I'm just like, oh, shut up. <laughs> shut up, you. You're so stupid. You know, All he's doing is just impersonate me. <laughs> and, well, because I would just say the dumbest conservative rip-off ideal th and then just chime in like excuse me trying to have a conversation here not uh, I, I wasn't good at being quiet <laughs> and uh That'd but make a good bonus episode i just want you to know you failed in that department of of, of, uh, of teaching him to be quiet well nobody's perfect <laughs> <laughs> you're one flaw either you like picasso or you don't it's just that simple. the irony of abdul thinking he can teach me how to be quiet Learn, master it yourself, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I have something to 
to say. If you, <laughs> I do too now. That's the, that's the problem. The student has become the master. And he's a millennial, which is even worse. I feel I feel entitled to this microphone, Abdul. <laughs> Title this. <laughs> no, but uh, you no. Know, he picked apart all of all of everything that I believed. And Your I was, flaws. And I was just going, I don't believe anything anymore. <laughs> so you think we should invade Iraq? How many Iraqis were on that flight? <laughs> exactly. You know, that right. kind of. That no, kind no, of like, was me. no, I think it was a conversation you and I had on the air. It was about uh, troop withdrawal in Iraq. Yeah. And Spengel was against any sort of timeline for troop withdrawal. Right. It's like, he's like, we should stay there till the mission's done. Then I, had, <laughs> then I remember asking him, what does that look like? Right. No answer. Silence. What does it look like that says your mission's done? Uh, uh, Rush twenty four seven isn't loading. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Immigration was another big key, and I and it, and it is interesting now. Where some uh, a, a, a northerner named Derek, who you would know, messaged me. It was like, um, well, what is your plan for these DACA kids? Amnesty. Um, do you think Trump made the right decision? Yeah, Trump made the only decision that he had on DACA, which was to let it expire and make Congress. You know, because he said, "I'm gonna, I'm not going to do the executive orders that Trump had done," and he, this was his only move, and it made perfect sense to me. And now it just seems to me to be a complete waste of our time to argue that these Americans are not American just because they were and brought I'll, and I'll take at you, two years old. Here. And I'll take you one step further. Let's say the DACA kid is now 22 years old. What if he's got kids? Mm -hmm. His kids are American Double citizens. Double DACA. Double DACA. His kids get to stay. Yep. Yeah. They have naturalization they're, 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 rights. They're citizens. If John right. McCain does, they better. Which you can get an immigration attorney. Or Ted Cruz. And, yep. and, and you can get your parents' green cards. Absolutely. They can immune. Yeah, not immune. Then they can, they, yeah, then it's sort of a, like a, a reverse immigration process. Correct. Where the kids, yeah. you know, are the sponsors for the parents. Then they're anchor babies. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, Abdul, why do you think that uh, someone started to argue with me today about immigration, and I brought up that they're the, the white identity politics because they were white. I never mentioned anything about race. I've always argued that the fundamental underpinning of the immigration argument is that these people that you're arguing against are not white people. You have no problem with the British immigrants. No, no, one, no one has a problem with the British guy who overstays his visa. Exactly right. I do. <laughs> Unless I get to remind him about the big can of whoop-ass Washington opened up. John, John Oliver. <laughs> you, mean, you mean the War of 1812? Yeah. <laughs> it's the current year. Is that, is that your White House? Oh, look, it's burning. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll be honest. Adams wasn't my favorite. <laughs> hey, Mr. Quincy Adams. If there was someone that you were going to smoke out of the White House, it would have been Adams would be my pick. Mr. Quincy Adams, could you, you need to leave, sir. Now. Yeah. The, the Globalist. When yeah. they did that to Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> the economic argument for immigration reform is there. I mean, we have, uh, if you, if, Alabama, I think it was Alabama or Mississippi passed a law about five years ago that was an immigration law that made it really nearly impossible for illegal immigrants to work in the state. And then they found out all the cotton fields. <laughs> Nobody was picking them anymore. It was, it, they yeah. rotted. And so we have a negative hiring rate in this country. We need these people because all those, wall, all those white wall, Walmart welfare queens are not going out to pick cotton. Truth oh, be told, yeah. they're not in the physical condition to do it. And yeah, that, isn't, right. that isn't like a, you know. I love the person who's true. using a WIC card complaining about illegal immigrants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, they brought people who were on probation who needed a job out in those fields in Alabama. They'd rather go to jail. Right. And, and the, the cool thing, Indiana did pick up a lot of different, like, uh, DACA people or I illegal immigrants from Alabama. I've yeah. met a lot of people from Alabama, uh, you know, who are, you know, not for, supposed to be. If you here. look at the last vestiges of the industrial West Belt, the the hourly worker is the DACA worker. Hmm. That is, the, I mean, if you look at it, seriously, if you look at what the labor composition based on demographics, it is entirely the people that w are willing to work for those wages mm -hmm. are the DACA voting block, yep. or mm -hmm. potential voting block. I'm not doing it. Right. Yeah. I got a manicure appointment tomorrow. Look at these cuticles. They look yeah. like crap. You have great <laughs> nails, though. Well, thank you. Yeah. I know. Maurice, she does them so well. <laughs> Maurice. But, but still, <laughs> Matt, you're soaking in it. <laughs> Isn't it interesting, though, because white er, cultural preservation, which is purely trying to maintain a, a stranglehold on white dominance within the political system, is self fulfilling prophecy because if you look at birth rates, it's inevitable that they're going to not white be. White guys can't get laid. Exactly. 
No, I mean, but really, the birth rates guarantee versus the death rate guarantees this is an inevitability. And when you have fewer mouths to feed, you have a slower growing economy and it becomes stagnation and you invite the very thing you're trying to avoid. Yeah. The only way to try and grow your way out of it and maintain like conservative principles traditionally is through immigration that keeps social security funded with new employees. Like that's why I think amnesty is inevitable because mm-hmm. all of a sudden the social security trust fund, instead of a bunch of people getting a cost of living, you know, or uh, no longer indexing it for a cost of living adjustment, COLA, all of a sudden they're like, yeah, give me the DACA's. I want to make sure that I get the additional one hundred and twenty-six dollars a year. Said, I've always said, what is the ultimate harm of bringing all these people above ground and have them paying taxes? You know what's happening in Houston right now is that there are a lot of illegal immigrants who are not going and seeking shelter. They're they're not going to the shelters because they're afraid they're going to get sent back. And they're not getting the help that they need from private organizations. These are human beings who are suffering and are not getting the help they need just because of their their immigration status. I have a problem with that. Like I like I have no problem with somebody who is here illegally getting some food when they have no no food, no water, no electricity. All I always said was when they start rebuilding Houston, people are going to start wishing they had an illegal immigrant. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They For absolutely they will. Because there's not going to be enough work people to go around to do all the rebuilding. Who, who will lay their their new pathway at Home Depot when there's no one standing out there to put in the back of the truck bed? Who do you think built Houston over the last 10 years in the first place? Precisely. It's illegal immigrants when everybody moved from New Orleans after Katrina. Yep. Mm-hmm. If there is a Texas creed, it is exploiting cheap labor when it is available. And remember the Alamo. They exactly. all got killed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, it is going to be interesting, though, because it's, it's, if we don't, if, if let's say that we succumb to this preservationist mindset as a country, all of a sudden, it becomes very much about dividing up the pie because we're already staying in growth. Tax revenues will stall out other than inflation, and then you have an ever-growing increase of debt. And so it's, it's inevitable that people will stop investing in the United States as potential, you know, a good place to put their money to nah, capture that'll growth. Never happen. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. you're seeing, if you look at the development of BRIC countries, that's where the money will flow. Because that's where the returns will be for investment. Yeah, because we got running water and no plague. No, no. I mean, we're much more. We're <laughs> yeah. much better. I want to invest in Bangladesh. Good luck with that cyclone that's coming. True, but I mean, you will see it in places <laughs> that are more economically stable that are developing. Like you'll see it as the tide changes in places like Brazil and some of the South American countries, provided their political institutions evolve. Well, yes. But well, India, India, India is right for growth. Well, they're still stable until they become Venezuela. They get some crappy socialist person in charge in oh, yeah. 20 years. Absolutely. They nationalize everything. Yeah. Right, but I mean, we're talking in 60 years. Yeah. Have but, you, but of course, if My I, brain will be in a jar. I'll be uploaded to Skynet. It sounds like, it sounds like a you problem. <laughs> yeah, it, no, it sounds like a you people problem. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy, code. <laughs> for right now, I've got a trial to YouTube TV. I don't care about you people. <laughs> right. yeah, China so, keeps making special economic zones and they just keep making and making it bigger and bigger you know i'll give it to them but you know with that still looming communist government over there that as long as they don't touch any of the special economic zones maybe they're possibly. only communist in, in tactic they're not communist well, they're, in ideology. No, they're but, communist but, but, outside but, the special economic zones yeah. but think but think about thing in china you know you built all these buildings keep all these people working but now there's no one living there right yes yeah. so you inevitably start becoming imperialist and sending those workers to go build in africa like they're trying to do right yeah, now correct. and build the silk road so sure. well they need they also need the uh, black women over there because there's not enough women in China. That one so child that, policy really screwed over them. Correct. So the, so the Chinese man, businessmen are going over in Africa getting black so they women. they want the one baby daddy policy? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they were going to brand it that way. <laughs> I think I that want, might fail. I want one baby mama for you to go. It's okay, though, because Asians out earn white, so everyone can make fun that of That is racist. <laughs> Abdul, those, those black lives you like people. Sh- you like the shrimp flight lice? Your favorite president was FDR, wasn't it? <laughs> well, I'm a Teddy Roosevelt kind of guy. <laughs> Shocking. Now, I'm going to charge up San Juan Hill. All right, everybody freeze. <laughs> <laughs> that is a really <laughs> good uh, Now, Abdul, uh, does this mean that you are just an open borders type of guy? Yes. But I always have been. Okay. I believe people should be able to freely go back and forth across your borders. Well, I, I mean, you in, grew up in that. that yeah, I believe of... in free trade and open borders. Because I'm a firm believer that healthy economic environments are what brings you world peace and stability. Yeah. Because people don't go to war when they trade with each other. Because everybody has economic interests. I don't go to war with my trading partner. But we have welfare. All these people will come over here and steal our welfare if we open up the borders. No, not really. Just so you can't get on it. Yeah, you already have to wait five years. Yeah. yeah. But they go to our hospital, and they uh, they use our, our medical doctors, and really? then we have well, to pay for it. I went over to IU and checked out the emergency room, I didn't see a whole bunch of people from Botswana sitting in there, you know. 
<laughs> that's, actually, that's actually an important point to make. Hang it out. <laughs> their lack of trust in institutions because of the illegal status. Who's they? So any Im- illegal immigrant. Anyone okay. that's here illegally. They're more likely to stay away from the emergency room. Exactly. Right. And, and it, but that breeds mistrust and, and fosters the whole mindset of not wanting them here. Because they don't participate, it looks like they're reclusive. Or it looks like they're secluded to the people that they are. You know, they don't look to institutions for justice and support. They and look also, to their community. And also, too, the cultures that they come from, the institutions you can't trust because they're even more corrupt than what we have here. Right. And who do those people tend to vote for? Yeah, because you've got you to pay the bribe you know, mm-hmm. to the police, to, you know, to the federales. Exactly. Right. They're not, they've never experienced, you know, slightly corrupt right. institutions. Yeah. Now, and, and, the thing, and the thing is, too, to piggyback on that, because I believe with you know, free trade, open borders, you improve the quality of life in the places where people are so they don't want to leave. Right. Mm-hmm. But Greg, Harry, Superfan Stone says welfare has to be abolished first. Welfare has to be abolished? You'll, right. You'll well, never, you'll, well, first of all, you'll never see that. Well, first of all, let's, let's define exactly what welfare is. What are we talking about? Income assistance. Such as? In the form of programs. Like a home mortgage deduction? No, no, no more so of uh, okay. bare necessities. Like a home mortgage deduction? That is a white people <laughs> welfare, and I don't like appreciate a, you exactly. shaming like me with okay. it. Like a home mortgage deduction? <laughs> no. Are you trying to say something? Or a like a? I wish which, you wouldn't racialize or, welfare. Or like a? Or like a tax break, say for all the equipment that you buy for your business. That's here. different. Shut up! Okay. How dare you Crank. talk about the different accounting methods? Great call. Great call. <laughs> <laughs> no, corporate welfare should go first. Is, is, is that is that the welfare? I know. I just left. You no, know, uh, five blocks away from Lucas Oil Stadium. <laughs> food stamps. <laughs> Literally, food stamps are. 30% go unused, but the corporations, gear, like they make that be a guarantee so they can count it toward their uh, quarterly earnings report mm-hmm. as revenue. Yeah. But, some, but also some of the stuff on the WIC program is like a lot of people just don't know how have the skills to use because right. you can't get like regular sliced cheese. You get block cheese. You get a lot of bare and essentials, and most people just don't know how to cook. But if you're, you know, like people see like all these, the illegals have, I... all these illegals have food, but it's like but they know what to do with a bag of rice, a bag of beans, and a bag of flour. Like, I'm going to sit here. That's man. Thanksgiving dinner in Vietnam. Yeah. But for me in the yeah. United States is – are we at a quality of life where you can complain about getting block cheese? First off, how, how, what a wonderful quality of no, life. No, where no, you I was get, very upset. Uh, the, the people Wick on card. the program are mad it didn't come in individually wrapped slices. Well, I'll do you one better than that. We live in a country where you complain that you can't get NBC on your dish TV. <laughs> right. Do you know how many fans of Kathy Lee and Hoda, white <laughs> women, are outraged by this? My mom is beside herself about this. Ready to switch to a different provider. Hilarious. I was very upset the WIC card did not cover, like, Wensleydale or my Havarti, you know. <laughs> very, very upset about it that. wasn't. I'll be honest, it wasn't even vegan, and that, but, that offends me. But here's <laughs> – I, I, I bring that up because it is the most quickly. common argument, and it makes sense in a very simplistic sense, mm-hmm. that we can't have open borders. Well, first of all, open borders will never happen, Stone replies. I understand, that, but, there yeah, will it's n- politically but there will never be open borders. But the argument against open borders is – we can't. We well. It's a magnet. We have to. We have to get rid of welfare first. Yeah. But that welfare is never defined. And and when you actually do what Abdul just did, which is what kind of welfare are you talking about? White people. <laughs> which Code. is which That's is what I said define it. What's a student aid? Sure. <gasps> and here I'll do you one better. If usually what most people say the definition of welfare is we're paying people not to work, then what is a farm subsidy? <laughs> That's a price floor that helped FDR win Democrats for years. What's a farm subsidy? Abdul, like? you're making the white people in the room uncomfortable. We What's just a farm want, subsidy? We just want to get rid of the minority welfare. One, <laughs> one man's welfare, you know, is a, you know, another man's corporate incentive for, no, that's for, so true. for economic growth. You never see Paul Ryan going out and talking about the need to reform the, the corporate handouts. You never talk about the accelerated depreciation schedules that they pass and, I, right? and, and, and escapes attention. And, I, and I'll do you another a step further. You know, when we talk about you know, the reform of the tax code, because people say we have the highest tax rates in the world, technically yes, but technically no, because I can do the math and accounting in such a way oh, that by the time I'm done, I have very little to no tax liability. Facebook and whatsoever. Google, with the double Dutch inversion, only paid 2% over the last 10 years. When I went to the accountant about a month ago and I found out about Tax credits, white privilege, and what I I learned about white privilege. I was like, so I'm starting this business. Trump. 
Trump. <laughs> Trump. <laughs> he's like, he's like, no, you made all this income, but you can write off all the losses. I go, yeah. but I didn't yeah. have any losses. And he goes, did you yes, buy it? Equi- right. Did you buy equipment for your podcast? I was like, only like thirty grand's worth. He's like, there you go, son. You are rich. You just learned about the carried interest deduction for hedge fund managers. Any p- past loss, they get a carry forward against profits made in the future, so yep. they can go back ten years on billions in losses and pay not a dime Andy on a hundred million. My anti-politics office is my spare bedroom, right. which means 25 to 30 percent of every household expense is a business. Now, expense. is a that's wife why there's that a cleans a considered an expense <laughs> as a uh, corporate cleaning deduction? Well, the wife doesn't clean; the maid does. <laughs> but you are. That's why you were looking at a curtain rod across my living room. <laughs> um, all right, so let's start wrapping up. Let's uh, at the end of the show. Is there anything else that we should cover? Oh, it's before? almost nine o'clock already. Yeah, that's why this, this show went by a lot faster than the last one I did. Oh, well, that's because uh, Harry's here. Yep. You feel more comfortable, don't you? My brother. Yeah. (laughs) Now they're black shaming us. Right. I feel excluded. If we all went to black shaming, we'd strip down. (laughs) (laughs) We've already seen a libertarian do that once. Let's not relive that on, you You look like a piece of cactus fruit on that stage. We're in a (laughs) thaw. Greg, anything that we missed? I would ask, uh, do you see that we're in just a weird climate, right? So it's, it's different where... You know, the demographic compositions changing American politics is going to be uncomfortable for everybody. And I don't think it's going to normalize anytime soon, um, in my opinion. Do you see it normalizing? Do you see a sort of realignment of American politics? I see the realignment as this. It's going to be those of us who get it and the people that don't. That is we're going always to, going to be outnumbered. That is, going to be the, that is going to be the new realignment. But we're going to be outnumbered. Mm, then we need to start procreating more. Ladies, my number is 317. <laughs> Abdul's happily married, so don't, don't my, contact him. Minority applicants are encouraged to apply to Dear Leader, uh, <laughs> by the way. No, no, but, no but I do think we're, we're split into basically it's, it's the people who get it and the people who don't. Mm-hmm. And the problem is, is what are we going to do with our unskilled labor? That is going to be the big issue. And as part of the debate that some people have about the, the old basic income guarantee, which is a Milton Friedman idea, mm-hmm. which sometimes when I kind of think about a Fundamentally, philosophically, I'm opposed to it, but the practical side of my nature says, you know what, maybe we ought to think of... Me too. I'm all for it, and to get rid of every other program. Think of something so, you know, even though you were an idiot and dropped out of high school and you shouldn't have, Mm -hmm. you know, we don't necessarily throw you to the wolves, so to speak. We're going to auto-deduct housing, food, and health care. Actually, what it reminds me of... It's a topic I brought up on the show once. This is the old WXNT days, and Chris, you might remember this. Mm-hmm. Is for a certain segment of the population, it's like, okay, we as a government will guarantee you a basic income, but you still got to work for it. So we yeah. are going to match you and what you do to a family that does not get a basic guaranteed income. What? <laughs> You got that look at your face. You thought that you, you're going to move to number one on that list if you ever say that publicly. No, but think <laughs> you're, you're not just going to be number four. No, but you're think, gonna think be... about it for a second. If, if, if I'm going to give you a basic guaranteed income because you have no you know, technical marketable skills, but you've got a strong back and a good work ethic, then let's match you up with someone who could use your skills and work ethic in the appropriate occupation. What I would tie it to is AmeriCorps and say you have to be employed to get the guaranteed income, and then it's whatever you make, we will either will make up the difference based on the price. But because it, you know, I really need a new like outdoor landscaping guy. <laughs> the guy we got right now, he's good, but eh. but if I can get he's one some, for free, he's got some reliability hmm. issues. But if somebody's got American gives income and they like working outdoors. The happiest day of Abdul's life was when he made me do yard work for 50 bucks in his backyard. Mm. I earned, Did you sit out there in, oh, in a men, white men suit? Yeah. The- <laughs> <laughs> it's not a joke. He sat in a chair and watched me cut down those trees. Christopher, the Civil War was a war of northern aggression. <laughs> Christopher, <laughs> y'all didn't miss a spot over there, boy. <laughs> well, Belvedere, come here, boy. <laughs> He's like, I don't know why I was afraid to move to Indianapolis. This is great. I've got my own boy. <laughs> That's why slavery is fucking awesome. <laughs> he, he goes, oh, reparations, reparations. <laughs> They're staying out there with a the lawnmower. Oh, and... my God. This was pre. Swing it's about, 
<laughs> this is probably about 2007. I was uh, 2006, 2007. I was so broke. Do you know how many people would cheer that today if that were if that if you put that out on indie politics mm -hmm. in social media? That would be quite Somebody the phenomenon. Is calling my name. <laughs> yes. Libertarian is so sounds like Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I asked. I swear he got that whip, and he was like, that is none of your business. <laughs> That's a family Do you know issue. Melissa? <laughs> <laughs> no, all right, all right. That's actually bought on Amazon. Thank you. <laughs> final final thoughts for this episode. Harry, why don't you show Abdul how it's done? <laughs> <laughs> He's just so excited about white, white reparations. He really is. The white man. And just for the, just for the Harry, uh, when they do his reparations, mm -hmm. don't take a check. Do direct deposit. That would never <laughs> go anywhere. Make sure you get your own spangle. <laughs> It's okay. Um, you know, I got deposited in three different banks. Trust me, I'll do direct deposit. <laughs> Harry's the most financially responsible member of Wall. I, not, not even a joke. I'm was, liking this young man. It He's was great. Aw it was awesome to get a call from the bank and was like, "Well, thank you for being a, a member for 15 years." It's like, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is your this is your illegitimate son that you did not know you had. I think I met your mother in East St. Louis. She was dancing on stage. <laughs> 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 the one thing I do like, I really do like Abdul on here because I've listened to his stuff for years, and it was really cool to watch, listen to him, hear him validate a lot of different talks, different things that I've heard from my father and my grandfather throughout the years about, you know, one just try to carve you out and just be black here in the United States, uh, just be your freaking self, and I am myself. But like that same talk that his that his dad was telling me, like you need to go be with your people. I had the same one. I remember my dad was telling me like. Um, Harry, you need to learn how to be humble. <laughs> what? <laughs> All right, That's um. a little different than saying, little Abdul, I need you to be a little more black. Just a no, little bit. No, we're getting ready to go back to the States, and yeah. I don't want you to be you know, ostracized at school. It's like, son, you know, just try. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, like, uh, like, what a lot of people don't understand is, like, like I said, I tell people, like, I'm an IPS survivor. I went to Indianapolis Public Schools. Played I, golf. I went to Northwest High School. Played oh golf. boy! Played golf. I know, right? Shocker, right? Uh, but like a lot of different things, a lot of people talk about is the people who make decisions there at that school. One of our co uh, one of the people who hosts the show, they made a decision, didn't show up, didn't show up all the time. Yeah. Um, I remember being in my American history course, and everyone in my in the entire class not wanting to listen to the teacher, not wanting to pay attention, and having to pick up my desk, put next to the teacher's desk, and tell like, screw those, screw the other like twenty eight people in this room, teach me. Right. You have to make your own choice out in life. You carve out for yourself. And you, as long as you work hard, you build yourself some skills, you, you will find a job. You yeah. will find out you get something. You, you know. Reliability itself is a marketable skill. I find out that I make a lot of, I get a lot of freelance jobs right now just for the simple fact I pick up the phone. Right. I pick up my phone. Woody Allen said 80% of life is just showing up. Is that right? Harry, you the food was terrible. These portions were so small. <laughs> <laughs> you are a real credit to your race. And Jew eat here. Get it, Jew. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Not only, no, man. We're going to be accused of white supremacy and anti-Semitism. Now, what else is new? Yeah, another have you, wall. Have you did better. <laughs> have you listened to this episode? Have you listened to the show? Hi there. <laughs> now we're homophobic. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a gay. We're fine. Yeah. And we're good. Harry is uh, looking for work. He, uh, you do what type of freelancing, and you are looking for a full time job too. Yep, uh, I do um, IT systems administration. Uh, I specialize in network administration, basically. Um, I'm more of a network and more into security stuff like that. So if you are trying to figure out if someone can hack inside you, uh, that'll be me. I can do it. I'm not. So a do hack you do software testing? Uh, or in that, in pretty much as part of security? I don't like doing it, but I can do it. It's not my thing. Send me your resume. Okay. I know somebody could probably hire you. Ooh, okay. See? Sweet. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. That's why we're telling you. If you but, give out give out your email. But that right there is a perfect because of their because of Abdul how his hard work has materialized into a network where a phone call gets you a job. Right. That is not He's gotten me out of tickets. Yeah. <laughs> there was one day where I I didn't have a license or a license plate and I didn't know it till I got pulled over and then the next morning the B and V commissioner was on the show and I was like Hey Abdul, by the way, and <laughs> and then he he picks up the phone. He goes blah 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 blah, and he goes, "Come on down." B we'll... B commissioner uh, says he'll take care of it, and so yeah, got me off scot free. But that, that, that's what I mean is is like so that is a perfect example of how that these effects can compound and reward. But where most people that don't choose to take it upon themselves to, to put it in their own hands, mm -hmm. they just show up at Monster this or go why, to this, a temp agency. Yeah, this is why I argue with our people. You gotta learn how to build a goddamn network. It's yes. everything. And yes. why hang around people who can't do a damn thing for you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
My, my, my dad always joked and said, so I don't want to hang out with Republicans. They had money. Democrats are always broke. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but you got to be willing to and be talk, courageous. Talk about, talk about some just social justice. Hell, social justice ain't getting me laid because they put no money in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, a lot of people, people misery loves company. Yep. And so mm-hmm. they yeah. refuse to go through the That's why the I pain. say there's very little difference at the end of the day between, like we had a conversation between the alt-right and the anti It's it, a bunch of out-of-work Starbucks baristas who can't get laid. Yep. But, one just has a the windmill of friendship and tolerance on their flag, and the other one wear black masks. One used mm-hmm. to... No, one used to work at Starbucks, the other used to work at AutoZone. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't be getting AutoZone as a corporate sponsorship. They're the official, official no, I, auto service provider of the used, Nazis. I said used to because they couldn't do, stay at AutoZone or Starbucks. Yeah, they couldn't show up. No, it was too yeah. much for them. Couldn't show up, couldn't spell names. Exactly, and that's the real problem, is that's the level of pride like these people have like, of their own craft and their ability to provide is, oh, it's so ridiculous. I should have to show up every day for a job where they pay me to be there and listen to what they tell me to do. Right. That's Crime against humanity. Yeah. Well, it's even sometimes you get with people who actually have skills. Like, you don't even believe how many IT techs I've met that are very stagnant in their skill set. Mm-hmm. Like, this is what I've done. Pascal will be here. People who need Pascal always in the future. Like, no one's using that right You're now. You're outdated. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah, I took that in college in like 1988. <laughs> Does anybody need a Fortran programmer? <laughs> you know, look, wait a second. You know what? I got my Commodore 64 out in the garage. <laughs> Let's see if I can link this up. Now, where's the thing on the back of the TV so I got the screwdriver to hook it up? <laughs> it might come back when people start bu- wanting to buy into like vintage computers, like so I get like so typewriters. Yeah, I still got my Tandy 1000, you know, in the basement, you know, just in case, you know, like see people want, you know. So I got my floppy disk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you, a guy that does really well that is purely a piano tuner in Indianapolis, and like he kills it. But he's one of the last of his kind. If you're the last man standing, you can make it. But other than yeah. that, you've got no hope. Yeah, we're on the friggin' endangered species list. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> got Scott Proof from the EPA come by to tag us later. <laughs> Racist <laughs> black people. You can. Uh, you're number sixty four, and you're number sixty seven. <laughs> yeah, that's why I think we're mostly like uh, every time I get pulled over, there's like two or three more cops behind it, just because like we got this black guy here with no criminal record. You've got to some see this <laughs> and they, they, they they he's a unicorn I you gotta, that's, you gotta why gotta I love driving, that's why this. i love driving in hamilton county because as soon as i cross 96th street several cops will follow me to make sure i get to where i need to be and they will wait for me until i have given my speech and then escort me back <laughs> to the county line you cannot get that kind of service <laughs> now, yes you guys except for hendrix morgan hancock and johnson and i i think we need to talk about racial profiling abdul you're being followed but you know what when you look this good you don't mind being profiled <laughs> I, I love the police escort it's fantastic if, if you want to get to harry if you want to offer him a job it's price at we are libertarians.com now uh this is your chance to mention anything that you missed on the show or if you can muster it, shameless self-promotion where people can find you. <laughs> the, re- the easiest place to find my work is IndiePolitics.org. That's where I do a lot of uh, my stories. We were podcasting before podcasting was cool. Mm-hmm. We figured out a way to sell it and monetize it before everybody else yep. did. <laughs> so uh, that's where you get like, news information. Also, uh, read my work at WIBC.com. Actually, just Google search Abdul Hakeem Shabazz. Yep. That's really all you need. And Abdul do. at Large, the show. Abdul at Large. And look for me at the law firm of Lewis and Wilkins and... Ivy Tech, University of Indianapolis, reasonable doubt for a reasonable fee. If we can't get you off, it's because you ran out of money. You know, dial 1-800-LAW-SUIT. Wait, you took the bar here in Indy? Uh, Apply for what's called reciprocity. Did you? Yeah. I thought you didn't want to have to. I, was, I just need my reciprocity. Well, I, I, when we talked about this once. Reparations. Oh, you know those R's. <laughs> reciprocity for reparations is what you did when you sorry, did his lawn. Sorry, hard R's get me all confused. <laughs> I thought you didn't want to be in a position where you had to take on, you know, people would ask you to represent them and you. Had... That was before I realized how much money I could make as a mediator. Gotcha. Mm. Gotcha. So well, that started, was that yeah, because I went to mediation decision. school to yeah. become a certified mediator in the state of Indiana. Yeah. <laughs> so and... what you're telling me is he said this. And you're saying that he said this. Here's what you need to do. Is that what mediation is? Well, I would understand why, though, because you wouldn't want to represent some, you know, you're already busy. You don't want to take on, have a bunch of people requesting right. and you. Right, see, the nice thing about mediation is you can do it on your own time and your own schedule. And, right. charge, and charge both. And, yeah, and charge anywhere, you know, on a slow day, 300 bucks an hour. Yeah. I That's the other thing I got from a duel, too, is, like, never have just one steady stream of income. Have yeah. multiple. Diversification. Yeah. Yep. yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So when I lost my job, I was like, oh, that one stream's gone. That may be the biggest, but, man, screw it. I just, Thank I'm God gonna... I founded Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> Do not find Bitcoin. Stop saying that. He's, <laughs> he's, he's genuinely scared that, I know. <laughs> that, that people think he's Satoshi Nakamoto. He's within one degree of separation. Yeah, when I get yeah. those emails, like, Satoshi, whoa, no. No, 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 no. 
You know, just like I don't like the term hacker. I was like, well, you're a hacker. Whoa, 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 whoa. I just do security, not hacker. <laughs> I'm a good guy. Wear the white hat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Those black hats. Mm. Uh, Harry, uh, your name is not Harry. Greg, your name's Greg. What uh, Final thoughts for this episode. Now that it was a good episode, thank you both for coming on. I was a little bit, uh, you know, I'm always nervous to have white supremacists on, but we pride ourselves on giving an open platform. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I saw. I opened the door for Abdul and saw all white and thought, oh, here we go. It's a crisp white shirt you've got on there, sir. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Spangle. I'm happy to be here today. Thank Lee Dottie waited to put on the hood till he came inside. <laughs> Why can my rear view, my rear view mirror? By the way, I wash my hands after weekly cross burning. So cool. uh, no, but uh, yeah, that was... Um, uh, this is a good episode. I think we talked about a lot. I look forward to you uh, continuing to provoke this. And I was shocked. This was a outlet that only had, you know, they have less likes than the Lava Flow podcast, a friend of ours. Which podcast. is hard to do because yeah. Ro- Roger Paxton has very small amount of likes. Yeah, the only thing less is the NHL in the United States. Right, like, it's basically non-existent. But you, you took this on, and you even gave them, you ratcheted up their exposure, which. <laughs> is really is really interesting because they're sitting there attacking you, and you will probably be. The reason they succeed, yeah. and that's why, and that's why it's a certain amount of almost sort of Rod Serling esque irony. Exactly, yeah. that's what got me. Was I've got this son of a bitch is going to be like, oh, remember when you grew after calling me a white supremacist? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Yep. Let that, that simmer. That hood just got ten feet taller. It really did. <laughs> <laughs> it's about a dunce cap. <laughs> no, I, um, I, I look forward to seeing how Abdul is targeted though going forward because once it's out there and once it's okay and you seem to invite it after the uh, whole Tylenol fo- social media comment about the cotton in the top. Oh yeah, that's right. The it's flame no, war you no, started. It's no joke. You used to use my stand-up comedy act too. That's the funny thing about it. Damn joke's like 15 years old. <laughs> Which is the old. I'm too proud to take. I won't take aspirin <laughs> because I won't pick the cotton out of the bottle because I have the big slavery flashback and just so <laughs> <gross> <laughs> the universe out of whack. Yeah. And of course, every white supremacist I know liked that, and I thought, oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know why aspirin's white. Because it works. <laughs> <laughs> that is offensive. <laughs> oh, boy. I want you to enroll in a diversity purpose. and sensitivity training seminar as soon as possible. Yeah, here's my diversity training. <laughs> Lots of people. I got rich black people, rich friends, and rich white friends. That's my diversity training. <laughs> Lots of people in the uh, Facebook group. And if you're, no- if you're in the nobility of We Are Libertarians, then uh, that's $10 a month on Patreon and up. Then you got to watch this show live. Brantley Spicer says, great episode. Abdul never disappoints. Christy Avery says, fun episode. And uh, so, so can I get a complimentary subscription? <laughs> yeah. There are some people who have asked for complimentary subscriptions. And you on- know what? Actually, I would never do that to a friend unless you trade it because oh, to, me, yeah. that's, to me that's offensive. Asking somebody like, hey, can you give me some hard hard earned work for free? Yeah. What? I'll totally give you one. You- Hook- hookers aren't free. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but Lincoln took care of slavery. Guess guess what? <laughs> My apartment complex doesn't take complimentary. Yep. Uh, so they take only memes. Street, <laughs> street cred doesn't buy you a house. Right. <laughs> We're trying to grow something special here, and we need your help. And that is what the uh, money goes towards, and uh, helping us expand and improve. And you guys came through, and we are up over seven hundred and fifty dollars a month at this point. And uh, the next the next goal is a studio at fifteen hundred dollars a month. Harry's already been uh, shopping mm-hmm. because we know our audience will come through because we want to have high. High speed internet. Oh, it's yes. two gigs up here, and it's very sad. And Harry's very upset about it. And mm-hmm. uh, we want to we want a place where we can uh, do do more and create more. And that is our next goal. Mm-hmm. And in the meantime, we're going to advertise and build a lot of cool stuff. I'm talking to some app developers and some other folks to do some various uh, cool things. And you guys are making that possible by joining us at Patreon. P a t r e o n dot com slash we are libertarians you've got an option for one five ten twenty five and a hundred dollars and listen uh, i i want to i want to take the opportunity to allow the audience to be price gouged so if you've made it this far into the episode you're gonna irma our audience i'm gonna irma and harvey the shit out of our audience (laughs) Uh, we have beautiful posters that are autographed by me and Kat and Harry and uh, Greg, and I will sell you one of those posters for a hundred dollars. You can buy one of those posters autographed. I'll throw in a second one because I'm generous and thorough. At a twofer, a hundred dollars. The PayPal address is chrisspangle at gmail dot com, or PayPal dot me slash We Are Libertarians. Hundred dollars, and you can get two posters. So if you want to be price gouged. 
you you can uh, send us your cash. It's voluntary. It's voluntary price gouging. It is. But I'm offering up this uh, special service. Uh, I, I want to give you to. Uh, I want to give you guys an opportunity to troll. Uh, first is Stone Aldridge, our new super fan, great kid. Amazing. He's guy. like he's like 17. He's in Tennessee. He went out and bought a prepaid credit card so he could join. Your entrance to your apartment is all Amazon boxes. I know. It's this our fan base is. They just go through and blanket buy whatever he puts up. Yeah, I got. Isn't it, it crazy? Stone is has like no job and bought a prepaid credit card so he could do, donate to us monthly. Sent us a beautiful join or die flag. That microphone. And so here's what I want to say to our audience. Stone is just he's so good to us. I want you to personally thank Stone. All right. So here's Stone's phone number. Stone, you and I need to have a talk. Stone, Stone's or subscribe to the cheat sheet. Yeah. Stone, I think you're missing a D at the end of your name. Stone. <laughs> Stone's phone number is four seven eight. Two five zero six nine nine three. You just trumped him. And I want you to text Stone and thank him for his generosity. Uh, we appreciate it so much. Uh, secondly, uh, I want to also, I found a group, and I don't know if they're real or not, so I think you guys should go ask if they're real. They claim to be real, but it is the, it's on Facebook. It's a page called the Libertarian Socialist Caucus of the Libertarian Party. What? Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Noam Chomskatarians. So, so what I did is I went and uh, I rated them five stars on Facebook, and uh, I just wrote great troll effort. I wish I had thought of it. Keep oh, up the God. good work. And so what, what I need you guys to do is go to their Facebook page and thank them for their efforts in trolling us and, and just basically like – The Libertarian guys, Socialist Caucus of the Libertarian Party? Yes. They, they said we're not trolls. This Are you is, fucking kidding me? <laughs> I'm not kid I'm not joking. They have fifty one likes. So please go. If they're real, it's even funnier if you just thank them for being so funny. Wait a second. The Libertarian Socialist Caucus about making the tent big enough for people to identify less left libertarians to find a home in the Libertarian Party. Not to supplant propertarian <laughs> viewpoints, but to add them. What the fuck is this crap? Yeah. <laughs> Collectivist. The, the idea is this: they're we're libertarian. Totally... We're libertarian collectivists. You know, Follow that's it. like my college group called Students for Apathy, <laughs> and three people showed up, so I canceled the damn meeting. <laughs> right. So <laughs> please. That's cool. I'm a banana octopus. What else you got? <laughs> I, I think they're a legitimate group. So here's what I want everybody to do: go to their Facebook page and just rate them five stars and thank them for being a comedy page, a satire page, and nothing is going to make them angrier than not being taken seriously. So we would appreciate that. And uh, does am I being pranked? <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a funny thing: these sons of bitches got the audacity to ask questions before you can join their group. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. It's a vetting process. You know, at 282 members, I think the question should be: Thank you for joining. We appreciate it. Abdul, it only takes one bad skittle. God, good St lord, gotta pass their test. Uh, I also want to what thank Jared. people. Jesus Christ. <laughs> we are the DACAs of their libertarian How movement. How many of you guys have managed to stay in control of this planet for so long? Your day is coming to an end. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's your cultural appropriation right there. It is. I want to thank Ab I want to, Now, this is not a troll. This is very serious, okay? I want to thank Jeremiah Morrill for two things. He runs the Boss Hog of Liberty podcast, which is on the We Are Libertarians Network. The uh, the Dakota Davis is his co-host. It's a really funny. Find it on iTunes or go to bosshogofliberty.com. Uh, first off, I want to thank Jeremiah for throwing me a birthday party. My birthday is September 9th. That's just here in a couple days. On Saturday. Uh, I want to thank uh, everybody who's given me presents and well wishes already. I want you all to go out to my, my personal Facebook page, donate to Rupert's Kids. I'm doing a fundraiser for Rupert's Kids for my birthday. I'm donating my birthday. Uh, but And Jeremiah is throwing me a birthday party. But Jeremiah is a generous guy, and I want to thank him for opening up his home to any libertarian from Florida who needs a place to stay. And uh, you just get—he's no Joel Steen. No, he is not. So get a hold of <laughs> Jeremiah, and if you need a place to stay, he will let you. His address is four thirteen Jenny Lane, Newcastle, Indiana, four seven three six two. But make sure you send him a message first. To any difficulty finding it, just go to any of the prominent establishments and ask where he lives. It's, and they will point you to the direction of the the uh, unofficial mayor of Henry County. It's M-O-R-R-E-L-L -L at WeAreLibertarians.com <laughs> if you need to send him an email. So, all right. Thanks so much. You guys are so awesome and so good to us. Thank you, Abdul, for coming on the show. Much appreciated. Hey, plenty of time for me to stop by Nicky Blaine's have a cigar for our call of the day. Excellent. Oh, and Monday night at Morty's. Monday night at Morty's, we're doing a live show on 9-11, Abdul.
Abdul. That's the show. See, that's the show you should have had me. <laughs> yeah. <on>. You <laughs> should come and I'll be like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> if you would show up and yell Alu Akbar, I would cry. That's honestly, that was a good idea. We should have had a Muslim on our 9 11 show. Yeah. And then he'd walk in eating like a, you know, a pork leg. You were making drinking a, with a bacon in one hand and a white woman in the other. You are, <laughs> you are absolutely encouraged and welcome to come Monday night to Morty's Comedy Joint at 7 p.m. 9 11 is a day I kind of go off the radar screen because I don't want to be bothered with people. That's the one day at talk radio I don't listen. See, this is the day when we decided to do a live podcast. There you go. So uh, 9-11, yeah, Christy's right. You can open for us if you want. Do your comedy set. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so, uh, yes. Just try to hit, not hit any towers. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what else was I going to say? Sorry, I just want to make sure we promoted that. Yeah, no, because we're, we're not good at promoting our own stuff. So, anyways, thank you, thank you so much to Abdul for coming on. Thank you, Harry, for coming to my house two times this week. Uh, you are, you are. The day starts calling you Rochester. We need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Kingfish. <laughs> no, Jack Benny, get it right. I know, I know, I know my Jack Benny. I was raised... Rochester. <laughs> But I got to give you guys credit. You were the first family in Plainfield to own a color TV, so they were breaking down barriers. By God, I'll tell you, they were pioneers of their time. They were the MLK of the Quakers. All right, thank More you. More like the MLFs. <laughs> oh, I know what I was going to say. You guys, we're not done. Abdul's going to take off because we're going to go yeah. let him smoke cigars. But we're going to record like another 20, 30 minutes of the po podcast. And if you want to hear that extra 20, 30 minutes on a different topic, what are we going to talk about, Greg? We're going to talk about the, uh, the exposure of the link between uh, Google Seed funding coming from the CIA. Yeah, so we're going to talk a little, a little bit about that here. Oh, on yeah. I want to stick around for that one. <laughs> Dab it off, please. Thank you. <laughs> Our audience loves Well, that. we'd know your search history would just be Abdul porn. <laughs> <laughs> I pleasure myself to a move named after me. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to hear it, the... <laughs> <laughs> only way to <laughs> trying to save it. The only way to uh, hear that is if you donate five dollars and up a month at Patreon.com/slash/WeirdLibertarians.com. So uh, if you're a fan, if you uh, hate us, you want to hear what we're going to say because it's going to be really offensive. And just for the record, I can finally say after watching the first nine months of the Trump administration. Strange women hanging out lakes, listening swords probably is a good basis for a system of representative government. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you for joining us on this episode of We Are Libertarians. We love you, we appreciate you, and thank you so much for watching. And as always, we promise to do better next time. Bye bye.